the subcommittee will come to order. Um, before I begin, I would like to uh, welcome our guests. Uh, in the first panel this morning, we have uh, Dr. Ann uh, Shuket, a Principal Deputy Director for the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention. She is the staff lead uh, for the investigation aspect. Then in our second panel, we will have the following witnesses. Uh, Renee Coleman Mitchell, Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Um, it was wonderful to speak with the Commissioner uh, at an event we, that we did several weeks ago about vaping. Uh, we were hosted at Yale New Haven Hospital, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your dedication to this issue. We also have Dr. Sally Settel, resident scholar, the American Enterprise uh, Institute. Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher, professor of pediatrics and the executive director of Tobacco Prevention Toolkit at Stanford University. And Meredith Berkman, co founder of Parents Against Vaping e Cigarettes uh, a, a PAVE, P A V E. I will introduce them. Uh, again, before their testimony, but we are so delighted that you could all join with us this morning. Uh, I know that our full committee chair is going to be here shortly, uh, and I, I mentioned Congresswoman Lowy uh, because this issue on e-cigarettes and vaping has been a signature issue for her. She has focused on it over and over again um, over, uh, over, over the years. Um, this is an important hearing. We are here for several reasons. To hear from the CDC on their investigations into e-cigarettes related to lung illness and death. We're here to talk about the ongoing federal response to the public health crisis of e-cigarettes. We know that the increased numbers of young people vaping have really created a public crisis. We're here to identify the public policy remedies we need to be advancing to address this public health crisis, and we are here to highlight the important investments we need to be making through the labor HHS appropriations. These investments include tobacco prevention and awareness activities and our national public health data infrastructure. There are multiple areas of focus because this is a multi-pronged crisis. One track is the rising incidence of lung injuries and deaths from vaping and e-cigarettes. The other is the youth epidemic, which is hooking the next generation on nicotine products. These are the symptoms, but at the heart of this issue is a fundamental question about the use of e-cigarettes and vaping. Are the products safe? Are they unsafe? Do we know? Do we have the scientific data, and how do we regulate these products? Of course, the CDC falls under this committee's jurisdiction. The FDA does not, although I do also sit on the Agriculture Appropriations Committee, which has jurisdiction over the Food and Drug Administration. But the work of these two uh, agencies is critical and linked. Yet while the CDC has routinely warned of the health risks of youth vaping starting back in 2013. Um, I, and I, I would mention to CDC, it was 2013. They published a report highlighting the doubling in youth cigarettes used during 2011-2012. Again, in 2016, they collaborated with the Surgeon General to release the Surgeon General's report entitled E-Cigarette Use Among Youth and Young Adults. Then again, in 2018, um, they, they again worked with the uh, uh, Office of the Surgeon General in writing and launching uh, an e-cigarette advisory to bring awareness to relevant audi audiences, teachers, parents, clinicians, um, et cetera. So the, the CDC has uh, 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 played a very constructive role in making information known uh, about, uh, about e-cigarettes. Uh, the result... No, no excuse at all. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt myself for a second to just to say that the chair of the Appropriations Committee, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago, Congressman Lowy, that this has been a signature issue of yours 
um, you know, for a very, very long time, and one that's near and dear to your heart. Um, I also might add, uh, you will always and ever be the chair of the Appropriations Ooh. Committee. So there, <laughs> my friend, anyway. Uh, I'm, I'm not standing because I want to speak out of turn. I'm just trying to adjust this chair. <laughs> well, we got to get rid of the chairs. The chairs are too big. The chairs are too big. Thank you for are your too kind big. words, yes. as long as I'm standing. Right. Uh, I, CDC has, I think, um, uh, 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 routinely warned of the health risks. I will just also say that the FDA has appeared to have ignored these warnings. It has taken no meaningful action to regulate e-cigarette products, though the Congress gave it the authority to do so in 2009 by talking about pre-market review of these products. The result of which is that we now have a public health crisis. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention has confirmed vaping-related lung illnesses have risen to over 1,000 cases and now 26 deaths with the numbers climbing each week. The FDA is investigating the link between e-cigarettes and seizures. And the US Surgeon General has warned that e-cigarettes pose risks for brain development, the human respiratory system, and lifelong nicotine addiction. In Connecticut, we had our first fatality. And one fatality is over the line. People should not be dying. The other part of this crisis is the youth vaping epidemic. It was on a cover of Time magazine, and the headline read, and I quote, the new American addiction, how Jewel hooked kids and ignited a public health crisis. According to preliminary results from CDC's 2019 National Youth Tobacco Survey, one out of four high school students have used e-cigarettes within the last 30 days. This youth vaping epidemic has nearly tripled since 2017. In my home state, vaping is now the most common form of youth smoking among Connecticut high school students. The commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Public Health will reference this, but there is, a clear, there is clear data demonstrating that as use of combustible cigarettes among teens is dropping, e-cigarettes are rising. Now, I spoke to my 14-year-old granddaughter. I think we're all speaking to our grandchildren at, at ages 13 and age 14. She's the first year in high school in Washington, D.C. And I said, Riggs, tell me, are there people vaping? And she said, Bubby, it's everywhere. Everyone is vaping. She even sent me some articles in their school newspaper. Uh, I've got to get her hooked on wanting to be a, uh, you know, get involved in politics and so forth and so on. But, but she sent me the articles showing me what her school is doing to notify parents of the dangers um, of Juul, of vaping, and of e-cigarettes. I recently spoke at an event with Dr. Uh, Panina Weiss, medical director for Pediatric Pulmonary Function Laboratory at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. She ran through the chemicals that are present in these devices. Ethylene glycol, which is used in antifreeze. Propylene glycol, which is used as toner for laser printers. Vitamin E oil, which is under investigation and implicated in the outbreak of lung illnesses. Fine particles and carcinogens fruit flavorings to attract youth, and nicotine, which is the addictive chemical in cigarettes that hurts children's brain development. One jewel pod has as much nicotine as one pack of cigarettes. You know, we have such little information about the chemical additives. One of them that, I, 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 that was brought to my attention was a, 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 a chemical called diacetyl. I dealt with diacetyl many, many years ago uh, because it was in, 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 manu in manufacturing. It causes something called popcorn lung, which is a very serious lung disease that we found. So th that, this is a cocktail. All of these pieces are cocktail. It's a recipe for disaster. Further compounding the risk to you is the fact that there's no approved nicotine replacement therapy for children under the age of 18, that we do not know what will happen to kids who turn teen vaping into a lifelong addiction. There is a lack of scientific data. A lack of FDA approvals is an important factor in this discussion that I want to touch on briefly. Despite the anecdotal claims that some businesses have made, there is no data demonstrating the long-term safety of vaping. There is no evidence that e-cigarettes are successful as a cessation tool. 
which experts have confirmed. And there is no e-cigarette that has been FDA-approved FDA as a smoking cessation device. Let me just, this was the, in 2018, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine report. They concluded, oh, and I quote, overall, there is limited evidence that e-cigarettes may be effective aids to promote smoking cessation. So we don't have the scientific data to move forward. Anecdotes, company claims must not be stymieing the bipartisan push to protect our communities, especially when the science is so clearly on our side. Today, the Energy and Commerce Committee is holding a hearing on a comprehensive legislative package that, among other things, would ban kid-friendly flavors. The Judiciary Committee is marking up my bill, the Preventing Online Sales of E-Cigarettes to Children Act. This bipartisan bill, which I first introduced in 2015, will close an existing loophole in federal law by mandating age verification of online sales and deliveries of e-cigarette and vapor products. Despite announcing a proposal, uh, which the administration did, to their credit, to ban flavored e-cigarettes that was well over a month ago, we have not seen anything yet. And we are now seeing industry pressure the administration into exempting mint and menthol-flavored e-cigarettes from its flavor ban, when these are among the most popular flavors among youth. Such action is necessary because clearly industry self-regulation is not working. Past time for the FDA to uphold its mission as a regulatory agency, use their authority to protect people from these harmful products. Again, I mentioned that this goes back to 2009. The Congress, the Congress said we gave the FDA the authority to regulate all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. The bipartisan Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, or TCA, gave FDA the authority to regulate new tobacco products before they enter the market, and that includes e-cigarettes. FDA has not. Instead, it's allowed dangerous products to come onto the market. It's exempted e-cigarettes from pre-market review. Um, and uh, again, what that review would have said is, is this product safe? It would have collected scientific data to test whether or not it was, uh, it, it was safe. The FDA uh, uses something called, quote, enforcement discretion and allow the devices uh, to, uh, 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 to, to be sold. I might add, I just want to say that in the past two administrations, this delay just has not been caused now. This delay occurred under the prior administration as well. Uh, and the delay continues. This is now 10 years of this product. And we now know that the industry is continuing to push to see if there is an opportunity for a future delay on what we talked about in terms of applications in May 2020. So there is this delay process which we have to break through. Here in our committee, the Labor HHS subcommittee, we have been advancing funds that could be a crucial part of the response. In the House passed fiscal year 2020 Labor HHS appropriations bill, we include $40 million increase for CDC's tobacco prevention and cessation efforts. Its Office on Smoking and Health is committed to a world free from tobacco-related death and disease. Um, this crisis has demonstrated the need for the $100 million that we provide in fiscal year 2020 uh, in the bill for a new initiative to begin addressing the gaps in our nation's public health data infrastructure. I might add, and I say this to you and to my colleagues, the Senate bill, the Senate bill has not put in additional dime into these programs. So... I think this epidemic has spotlighted the gaps in our public health data infrastructure. I believe what we have done in this committee is the right thing in terms of increased funds, and we have to persuade our Senate colleagues to do the same. When it emerged, the CDC had to create entirely new databases and systems. The process was neither speedy nor seamless. The first iteration crashed and burned in less than a week. System errors and bugs the second iteration required states to enter data by hand in a cumbersome, fragmented, and not automated file submission process. 
It's further evidence that our public health data systems are too antiquated. They are in need of a, grade, a grave need of upgrades. Our systems still rely on obsolete technologies like faxes and compact disks. To me, this is evidence as to why we need $100 million in the House passed bill. But as I said, this is a crisis demanding more immediate action than our funding for uh, uh, fiscal year 2020. I know many of our witnesses today have recommendations for what the Congress can do and should do. Please share with us your suggestions. We need your help, and we must act, and we need to act now. Uh, let me just turn this now over to my uh, good friend from Oklahoma, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Congressman uh, Tom Cole, for any uh, remarks he may want to well, make. Thank you, Madam Chair. Before I begin my official remarks, it would be remiss of me because I have not seen our chairman since her announcement that she's going to retire at the end of this Congress to tell her how much we're going to miss her, how much we admire her, and the manner in which she has led this committee as chairman and, and the manner in which she served it when she was ranking member in all the years of service in all the capacities. Uh, you've been a member's member and an appropriator's appropriator, and I just... Uh, you're going to be sadly missed. Now, I was also going to throw my support to my chairman to be the distinguished ranking member of the full committee uh, the next, uh, next Congress, and so I'm happy to head the Republican effort uh, to get that done. But uh, again, both of you have served uh, with such great distinction, and it's always been a pleasure. You were always uh, at this committee when I was privileged to be the chairman. You're always here now. We know how interested you are in these subject matters. And I certainly associate uh, myself with the ranking, excuse me, with the chairman's uh, remark or the chair's remark that uh, we know you're passionate and knowledgeable about this subject and we appreciate your, your input and your guidance. But uh, more than that, we just appreciate you as a friend and as a leader in Congress for many, many years and uh, uh, wish you well in whatever you choose to do next. I'll speak out of turn by just saying <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you, and I really do think um, what I will miss most is all the friendship, because we've had the opportunity to work across the aisle and, of course, all my friends on this side, uh, so I want to thank you. But I'll be here about 15 more months, so we can do a lot of good work. Thank and you. We for look your forward to working words. with you in those 15 months. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I want to, again, thank our chair for holding this important hearing. We've all been alarmed by the frequency of lung illnesses related to the use of electronic cigarette products. We are the third committee to hold a hearing in the last few weeks on this topic, and I'm glad to see such a concerning issue getting serious, rigorous oversight and attention. Over the last few months, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention began an investigation into lung illnesses and deaths associated with e-cigarette use. Of particular concern is the relationship of those getting sick and the use of THC, the psychoactive compo uh, compound found in marijuana. Recent investigations in Wisconsin uncovered 10,000 THC vaping cartridges in a residential home. We, we know obtaining cartridges from friends, or on the black market is dangerous. An overwhelming majority of the lung illnesses uh, uh, incidences are linked to THC containing uh, products, although certainly not all of them. Uh, as we've seen, states uh, pass laws permitting greater access to marijuana. The market for devices using THC has exploded. This market growth has spawned a new black market for the production of THC laced vape cartridges. A report uh, released from Wisconsin and Illinois found that nearly all THC-containing products reported were packaged, pre-filled cartridges that were primarily acquired from informal sources such as friends, family members, illicit dealers, or off the street. And we should be cautious about associating THC-related misuse to appropriate use of nicotine-only products. And the same report found that over 80% of the nicotine-containing products were obtained from commercial sources. An overreaction uh, of banning the sale or purchase of nicotine-based products could very well endanger more people. Studies have shown nicotine-based uh, products do provide an alternative to traditional combustible cigarettes, an alternative uh, that is safer and often assists smokers to abandon the use of cigarettes. The reduction in the use of combustible tobacco is one of the largest public health achievements in the last decade. 
E-cigarettes have been part of this reduction, and they can continue to serve as a healthier alternative for adults who are current smokers. The CDC acknowledges that e-cigarettes have the potential to benefit adult smokers when these products are used as a substitute for regular cigarettes. The science around the benefits and associated risks of e-cigarettes is still new and in many cases not available. More research on the impact of these devices um, you know, have for adult users is needed and currently underway at the National Institute of Health. Uh, if we remove nicotine-based e-cigarettes from sh uh, store shelves, there's a strong likelihood adult smokers uh, will continue using combustible tobacco, and that's something to be avoided. While I believe the product should remain an option for adults, we can all agree that children should not be using these products under any circumstances. All necessary precautions should be taken to ensure e-cigarettes and associated products stay out of the hands of children. Moreover, companies selling these products should not be targeting children in marketing or advertising. These are principle on, principles on which we all agree. Uh, and uh, it, to its credit, the Trump administration has taken aggressive, an aggressive approach to keep these products out of the hands of children. Under the Food and Drug Administrator Gottlieb, the FDA issued more than 8,600 warning letters and imposed more than 1,000 civil monetary penalties or fines to retailers related to the sale of electronic nicotine devices to minors. The FDA has also issued warning letters to companies related to marketing efforts that could target children. The Surgeon General has launched a prevention initiative aimed at educating young people on the dangers of e-cigarettes and information on how to stop the use of these products for those who may already uh, be active users. President Trump has also uh, announced last month that his administration would be looking at potential future regulatory action regarding the use of flavored products and e-cigarettes and the impact that such a decision could have on teenage usage. I want to commend the work of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, the leadership uh, by the CDC is critical uh, to uh, understanding the emerging public health issue. Uh, publicly, I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Shugit for her efforts in testifying here today. Doctor, you've come uh, to the Hill several times in the last few weeks for several committees, and I'm sure you'll be invited uh, back more in the future. We appreciate your service. In the span of a few weeks, the CDC has set up a response team to track, respond, and inform all interested parties on this troubling public health issue. CDC is sending assistance to states, supporting lab tests to learn more about the illnesses, and providing guidance to public health departments and clinicians nationwide. Their work here demonstrates why investments in our public health infrastructure can prove critical. A complicated issue that involves coordination amongst enforcement, research, testing, clinical diagnostics, and an ongoing public awareness campaign demands a public health infrastructure that can mobilize and respond rapidly. And that's exactly what CDC has done in this case. I also want to thank uh, our second panel of witnesses for coming here today as well. We look forward to learning from you and appreciate your time. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this uh, really genuinely important hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thanks, and gentlemen, and now it gives me great pleasure, and she said it well, you know, it's uh, 15 months. We can do a lot of great work in 15 months, and she will continue to do that as chair of the Appropriations Committee. I'd like to yield uh, time to... Uh, Congresswoman Nita Lowy. Well, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and my friend, ranking members, and members on both sides of the aisle. We've been working together on critical issues for a long time, and I love this committee. My heart is within this My heart is with all the committee, but my special <laughs> love here, and uh, I look forward uh, to hearing your testimony. I just want to say I remember very clearly and I think um, my, my friend, the chair, had a similar experience. My granddaughter was visiting me a few years ago in Washington, and we were just chatting around the table with another friend. She brought a, another friend with her. I didn't have the foggiest notion that this even existed, that it was as widespread and when she said that 60% of the kids in her high school class, 60% were addicted, I said, what? 
And that's when I and many of us began really aggressively going after this. In fact, uh, I walked into a local store, and I said, I'm going to do everything I can, sir, to put you out of business. Have a good day. <laughs> True story. Wish I could be more successful in that. Um, but uh, I do want to thank our chair, Ranking Member Cole. Thank you so much for holding this hearing today. And I want to thank, there's so much going on for all my colleagues on the subcommittee for being here. And we're all pleased to welcome our distinguished witnesses. To say that we're concerned is the biggest understatement. Because since that time, I've had roundtables in my district. I've talked to dozens, perhaps more, hundreds of kids. Um, and when you hear now, there are 26 deaths confirmed, including in my home state of New York. It is really shocking. The dramatic use in, of these products among youth, which is an epidemic, is alarming. When you look at the numbers, one in four kids are using e-cigarettes. And now a new generation of Americans is hooked on nicotine. So as a member of Congress with a long history of support for anti-tobacco efforts and advocacy for tough regulations on e-cigarettes, but as a mother and a grandmother, it really is so heartbreaking in addition to being outrageous, that we are at the nexus of two public health crises, vaping-related illnesses and deaths, and an epidemic among youth that really was largely avoidable. I do remember my meeting with Dr. Doc Lieb in the office, because my wonderful staff, who's now on maternity leave, brought me all kinds of samples that you could buy in the mail. And frankly, I shouldn't have been so innocent, but I said, what? Tutti Frutti, all these different flavors that clearly were encouraging kids and that they could just buy in the mail was so shocking to me at a time. So in my role, as chairwoman of the House Appropriations Committee, I have consistently opposed tobacco industry efforts to weaken FDA's enforcement of the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. I supported this committee's increase for the CDC's Office on Smoking and Health in fiscal year 2019 and I support a further increase in FY 2020. This is particularly important now given the current outbreak in illnesses and deaths related to e-cigarettes and other vaping products. So I want to urge again the CDC to continue its vital laboratory research and investigatory efforts to get to the bottom of the ongoing outbreak to update the public on the serious health risks associated with these products. In fact, I have to, I won't go into too much detail, but I was part of one of my roundtables where I was really arguing with the, some of the young people there who thought, hmm, nothing wrong with it. Boy, they didn't realize now that they are addicts. But at the time, they thought, nothing wrong with it. Um, and I just want to say that I know how important it is that CDC receive adequate funding to do the work. The advocacy community must remain vigilant in helping to communicate to the public the risk of these products. And we have to do everything that we can through legislation, outspoken, out <laughs> sourcing the message wherever we can get it. But I really do thank the chair and the ranking member for having this hearing today. I think it's so very important because somehow, although we've known about this for a couple of years, the numbers keep increasing and increasing, 
and on public schools, private schools, wherever you go, the numbers of abuses keep increasing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, and now let me uh, recognize Dr. Ann Schuchat, Principal Deputy Director for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, I want to just say thank you uh, for being here today and for the many, many times that you have uh, come before us and you've been at the forefront of a number of these public health crises, and whether it's Ebola or other infectious diseases, and we're so grateful uh, for your expertise and competence, but for your dedication and for your commitment to these issues. Thank you so much. Your full written testimony will be entered into the hearing record. You are now recognized for five minutes. Well, th thank you so much, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, um, and members of the committee. I also want to um, congratulate um, Chairwoman Lowy on her retirement, and thank you for your many, many years of service to the nation. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, and I'm happy to come back, okay? <laughs> um, I, I'd like to tell you today um, what we know and what we don't know and what we're doing about the lack of knowledge and also a bit about what we're doing about the youth epidemic of e-cigarette use. I want to make four key points. First, since we first learned of these cases of lung injury, CDC has been working 24-7, hand-in-hand with state and local public health as well as the FDA to try to get to the bottom of it. Secondly, our ability to do this kind of investigation critically relies on the infrastructure of public health, including the data systems that need modernization and a trained and data savvy workforce. Thirdly, CDC has made important recommendations for the public based on the investigations so far. We've recommended that people do not use vaping products that contain THC. Regardless of this investigation, e-cigarettes or vaping products should never be used by youth, young adults, pregnant women, and people should not acquire these products off the street and they shouldn't further modify them. Adults who use e-cigarettes or vaping products because they have quit smoking cigarettes should not return to smoking cigarettes. Fourthly, we need to address the broad epidemic of e-cigarette use among youth. What we know so far um, about this epidemic is that it's striking young people. More than half of the cases are under 25 years. About 70% are male, and new cases are being reported every day. I expect this week's numbers to grow considerably. What we don't know, unfortunately, is the cause. We know that the most recent report suggests that most patients report using THC-containing products or both THC-containing products and nicotine-containing products. However, because nicotine-containing products have been reported to be used either alone or in conjunction with THC-containing products, we cannot exclude the possibility that nicotine-containing products play a role. No single product, brand, substance, or additive has been identified in all cases so far. It may be that there's one cause or that there are many problematic substances causing lung injury. And there may be complex root causes for the increases that we're seeing right now. CDC is working vigorously with states to respond. We've dispatched our disease detectives to assist some of the state and local public health departments. We've activated our emergency operations center. Our incident manager is coordinating a response. Last Friday, we issued updated clinical guidance based on inputs from clinical experts who have been caring for these patients and the accumulated information from cases around the country. We're doing frequent calls with the public health community, clinical organizations, and the media to keep people informed. We're working very closely with the FDA on traceback of products that people have used. And our laboratory is assisting with the clinical pathology testing and working with FDA's lab on testing of products and aerosols produced by the products. But this outbreak has a number of challenges. The investigation includes trying to gather information about exposures to potentially illicit products, so some respondents may not be totally forthcoming. State laws vary regarding THC and cannabis use, and that can also complicate the data collection. E-cigarettes or vaping products are part of a marketplace that is very wide and extremely diverse. A multitude of product varieties and different substances can be used with the devices. 
and there's a, the issue of counterfeiting or black market products. Public health data collection for this response, as you've said, is relying on antiquated and fragmented systems that need modernization. The disease, unfortunately, is moving faster than our data systems, and that, that is a barrier to getting to quick answers. Briefly, I want to mention the epidemic of youth use of e-cigarettes. We know that youth are much more likely than adults to use e-cigarettes, and that flavors are a key part of that appeal. We've been messaging our concerns about youth use of e-cigarettes since 2013, when we got the initial data about the alarming increase from 2011 to 2012. The problem is much worse now, and we continue to consider this of great concern. In closing, CDC is dedicated to working around the clock together with state and locals and with the FDA to get to the bottom of this and to keeping you updated. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Shukit, uh, August 1st, CDC was notified by Wisconsin about a cluster of pulmonary illness among young adults that began in July. September 16th, CDC activated the Emergency Operations Center. It's now exactly a month later, and the outbreak investigation of this suspected chemical exposure is ongoing. During your career at CDC, you've been engaged in or lead, led numerous responses, including H1N1, pandemic influenza, SARS, Ebola, and anthrax. How is this outbreak similar or different than others conducted by the CDC? And if I can just mention a follow-up at this moment, what impact do you expect flu season to have on the current outbreak investigation? It is my understanding that lung injury from vaping can result in symptoms that might be misdiagnosed as the flu. Thank you. Um, you know, I have been involved in a number of complex multi-state and also international outbreaks. This is extremely complicated and difficult. It's affecting young people. It's fatal or potentially fatal with half of the cases requiring care in an intensive care unit. It's affecting every state. And it's not caused by an infectious pathogen, which is our usual story. But like most of the other outbreaks, it's relying on the public health infrastructure of the nation, state, local, and federal. And CDC's tried and true approaches with our Emergency Operations Center and Incident Management System are helping. But um, as I've mentioned, the, the antiquated data systems are kind of handcuffing of it at some point. The issue with influenza is very important. We're right now moving into the winter season when influenza illness may be increasing, as will other respiratory viruses that are common in the winter. Last Friday, in our updated in clinical guidance, we um, urged recommendations for evaluating individuals with um, respiratory symptoms to consider both lung injury associated with vaping or e-cigarettes as well as influenza and to treat for both if appropriate. Um, of course, a person who has lung injury or lung damage from e-cigarette or vaping product use may be vulnerable to worse complications of influenza. We don't want to withhold treatment of one at the expense of the other. It's going to be a very challenging winter. Last year, there was an outbreak of E. coli that sickened 62 people in the U.S. When CDC determined that the source of the outbreak was romaine lettuce, CDC delivered the clear message, do not eat romaine lettuce. However, despite CDC's overall warning to the public that no one should use tobacco products, CDC's message for weeks around an outbreak that has sickened nearly 1,300 people, killed 26, has been to, quote, consider refraining from using e-cigarettes or vaping products that contain nicotine. Let me just ask you, um, why hasn't CDC's warning been more urgent? Um, uh, why, why are we not saying don't use e-cigarettes at all until we figure out what is going on? Thank you. We, we strive for clear, actionable communication for this investigation, we're trying to update our recommendations frequently based on the best evidence available. And we have updated that information as more and more data has come to light about the THC containing um, pre-filled cartridges. Regardless of this investigation, we want to be very clear that e-cigarettes should never be used by youth, young adults, 
people who are pregnant or by adults who aren't currently using tobacco products. No tobacco product is safe, and we really want to make sure that's clear. But for the outbreak investigation, we're following the evidence and trying to make our messages as clear as possible, but still evidence-based. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me just say, the, the current outbreak really highlights the role of CDC and the FDA. Uh, and working together in terms of the public health. CDC, well, FDA is a regulatory agency. What role does CDC have in providing information to FDA as it makes regulations? We work very closely with the FDA to share the evidence that we have um, in fact, we actually collaborate on the National Youth Tobacco Survey, the results that showed that shocking increase in the e-cigarette use in, in high school students and middle school students. So we feel that our, as an evidence-based, data-driven agency, we want to get the best information possible, available as quickly as possible to the regulators, but we don't make the regulation ourselves. But uh, just, I've got three seconds here. In terms of, do you have any sense of timing when you will make a forthright statement the way you did on do not eat romaine lettuce to the public? I mean, what is the, what, what is the timing of that? I understand the, the areas that you have carved out uh, about youth, young adults, pregnant women, but where are we going on this? Right, we, we follow the evidence, and as we update we update it as there is more evidence. So our, our you know, there is, um, for this investigation, we've updated to say do not use e-cigarette or vaping products containing THC. Do not buy any products off the street or from um, informal sources. Mm -hmm. But for the e-cigarette use in general, we have um, focused on the populations where the evidence is very clear in terms of the developing brain up through age 25. That's why we focus on young adults as well as youth, and on pregnant women. In terms of adults who are trying to quit smoking, there's mixed evidence now, and none of the products are approved as cessation devices, but that's an area where we haven't said don't do that yet, and that's basically following the evidence as it emerges. And to be clear, THC, while it's a factor, it is not the only factor. Nicotine is a factor. So that the notion that if you remove this THC, then everything is hunky-dory. It's all right to move forward. That's not what you said. You said that it plays a very, nicotine plays a very, very strong role in, in what the problems are. Well, the, in terms of the youth use of e-cigarettes, it's a huge role. In terms of the epidemic of lung injury, we don't know yet. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you very much for your testimony. It's, it's very helpful. This, uh, the speed at which this uh, has evolved reminds me sometime of the opioid crisis or things like that, where we've seen products have consequences we didn't really initially understand when they were released into the marketplace, and particularly the youth addiction. You mentioned in your testimony some of the various factors that make this so difficult to analyze compared to an infectious disease. I'd like you to elaborate on that a little bit, particularly in, in two areas. One, uh, in terms of the difficulty of, of investigating when you have illicit use in many of these cases, the TH. And second, what, if anything, does the difference, and you touched on this a little bit in your testimony, the difference in, in marijuana laws at the state level, which we've had an explosion, of legalization, obviously, in the last few years. How does that play into both your investigation and the potential spread of, of uh, the delirious uh, consequences of, uh, of uh, vaping here? The, um, some of the complications of the investigation involve the substances that are being used. The e-cigarette or vaping products have a variety of components they're not necessarily labeled fully, and there are probably are counterfeit and black market um, influences such that even if there were labels, they wouldn't be telling you everything that's inside. In terms of the interviews with patients who are very, very ill, they may be too sick to tell you. They may have had many different products that they've used. I think some of the interviews suggest like 40 different products that people report having used. Um, there may be little product left to test. 
Um, and it may not be the product, it might be the device that the product's being used with, or the aerosol that the product produces. So the laboratories are busily testing a variety of things. There may be more than one outbreak. You know, this outbreak that's nationally got our attention may be a lot of local sources of problematic substances. Um, in terms of the um, state laws, obviously we're working very closely with the states, we're working very closely with the FDA and the DEA on the, the traceback investigations and the particular um, substances. In terms of um, interviewees being forthcoming, of course um, there's some issues about if they will be forthcoming about an illicit product, but I think it's also worth remembering that a lot of kids don't want to tell their parents that they're using any kind of tobacco product that, of course, it's, it's illegal in most states, depending on the age. So there's um, a, a challenge for the clinicians and the state investigators to gain trust and get real, real histories from people. Um, so this is complicated, fast moving, and challenging, but it's critical, and it's exactly why CDC exists, to stop this kind of outbreak before we have um, more, more deaths. Obviously, we're, you know, vaping is done internationally, not just here. What are your contacts in other countries with other healthcare organizations, are they, they experiencing the same sorts of things that we are, somehow different? Is there a better regulatory scheme that you've seen out there than uh, we have? The, um, the international contacts that we have do not um, reveal a large problem in other countries. There's individual reports being investigated, but nothing right now like what we've seen. Um, the regulatory environment's different, the smoking environment is different, the um, lucrative market that we have in this country has really, um, you know, both the legal and illegal markets are um, very profit-oriented, so I, and, the, um, and the environment for um, smoking cessation is, is quite different country to country. So sometimes uh, an outbreak, a foodborne outbreak might be international, this one doesn't yet seem to have international scope. Um, again, you mentioned the opioid epidemic. We're experiencing a very different opioid epidemic than Europe, but we had a backdrop of a huge amount of prescription opioid use. I, I do think it's possible that the epidemic of nicotine containing e-cigarettes has created a generation that's almost addicted to vaping, whatever the product is, and now we have devices that are so small that can be used discreetly inside the classroom with no odor and um, making it very hard to, um, to, to, to stop that behavior, uh, whatever's in the cartridge. Well, again, I know we've uh, put a lot on your plate here, and I, I frankly appreciate the quality and the speed with which you're working. Uh, but I would hope that you look at this internationally as well, just to see if there are lessons to be learned from other countries and uh, to see if there's some unique factors, obviously, in, in the problem we have in this country that, that truly are a product of, of either the manner in which we regulate or the diversity of regulatory schemes that we have across multiple state lines. Thank you, and we, we do have, um, you know, we've actually just last week formed an international team as part of our incident management and are connected with the uh, WHO and with um, European and Canadian colleagues. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Congresswoman Lowy. Thank you, and I want to follow up on the wise comments of my good friend, Mr. Cole, Thank you. I was just complimenting you. So, <laughs> because, oh, you're always my good friend. But I think that's a very important point that I want to follow up on. Um, E-cigarettes have been marketed as an alternative or off-ramp for existing adult smokers seeking to stop using combustible cigarettes. Several of us, as you've heard, are concerned that this is a false narrative that only encourages tobacco use and that both adults and young people will, for lack of a better word, graduate to combustible cigarettes if they use e-cigarettes. So number one, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. And I know CDC has been working on the stop smoking for a long time, but what more can CDC do and what help is needed from Congress to help current e-cigarette users and smokers just quit? I'll leave it at that. 
Yeah, well, CDC acknowledges that um, e-cigarettes are used by some adult smokers to help them quit, um, and there's emerging data about um, whether there's strong enough evidence there for that to be recommended. Although they are, none of them have gone have gotten approval from FDA for that per, as a cessation device, but we are very, very troubled by the marketing to youth and the flavors and the um, stealth approach to get um, teens hooked on e nicotine-containing e-cigarettes with very high levels of nicotine and sort of a life of addiction. And we share the concern about whether they will move on to combustibles and the dangers that nicotine has on the developing brain in general. Um, in terms of um, the, the support from the committee and from Congress, we really um, were, were very appreciative of the proposed um, increase in the tobacco line. Our um, state and local colleagues tell us that um, they are stretched very thin in terms of uh, addressing the epidemic of adolescent tobacco use while continuing the other approaches that are so critical as part of a comprehensive tobacco control project. And we're also um, very um, uh, appreciative of the proposed increase for the data systems, which we think is just vital. Um, the, what we know right now about how to help uh, young people quit tobacco um, or e-cigarette use um, is, is not as much as what we know about adults, but we think that in addition to the individual uh, counseling and cessation efforts, the environmental or population-based activities are very important. The tobacco-free indoor areas, the, um, the restrictions of where the products can be sold and so forth, that can reinforce youth not being able to um, go back to um, uh, nicotine use if they, if they stop. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work to be done, and unfortunately, um, while there's a strong evidence base of how to reduce tobacco use, we um, have a growing problem of a new generation that we need to apply those tools to. So we do know what works, but we have to apply it on a larger scale than we did. Well, I thank you so much. And just closing, I wonder what kind of research is being done on just that. If, if more information is coming out about THC and kids are getting a little worried because they see their friends coughing, 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 getting sick, is there any movement to using e-cigs without the THC? Because you don't want them to be addicted to nicotine with or without. I just wonder if it's too early or what is happening out there. You know, what I would say is that it's hard for us to keep up with the behavior changes. We know from the National Youth Tobacco Survey that among e-cigarette users of nicotine-containing e-cigarettes, um, use of THC is very common. You know, about a third of them also use um, THC in their devices. But um, our annual survey barely is keeping up with the market changes and the product um, introductions. We do sales monitoring to keep up with that. But I think we have to um, really pick up our pace to understand what the practices are in order to intervene. So there's, there's just a lot to do right now. And again, it's kind of shocking how large the numbers are of teens now that are um, reporting current use, and much of that current use is frequent use. Well, I have two seconds left, or minutes, whatever this is. So I just want to thank you. And this is what's beginning to worry me. So if they say, OK, I don't have any of that stuff in there, but they're getting hooked on nicotine. Yeah. Just when we were making products, pro <laughs> progress, <yeah. laughs> progress is the word I was looking for. So I thank you for your work. And we have to obviously invest more and just stop it. No smoking. Thank you. Don't get started. It's more the work. Congressman Molnar. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Dr. Shugat, nice to see you again. And uh, thank you for being here and for your testimony. Um, you had mentioned the, uh, the challenge of uh, the data collection and reporting systems being antiquated and fragmented. Could you speak to that a little bit and also what you feel Congress should be doing to help address that in terms of investments in CDC's data collection and reporting systems, also kind of where you see data standardizations and interoperability um, being a hindrance to some of these investigations? Yeah, th thank you. The, um, the public health data system 
has a lot of challenges right now. There, um, if you look at what has happened in the healthcare information technology, we've really seen a dramatic improvement in electronic medical records across the country and in um, better use of technology to improve health. The public health system hasn't benefited from that. The systems that we rely on are different in many states. Many states don't are still using paper and pen or faxes. Um, when we have a multi-state challenge like this, there's different approaches in each state, and we try to get consistency. And we're not connected with the healthcare system records. So when you're trying to review a complex medical chart about a difficult lung injury, People are faxing, you know, hundreds of pages of medical records to the health department for that review. We're just not using technology effectively. CDC has been working on a strategy and a plan of how to catch up. And um, we are working with the public and private sector on that strategy. But we really think that um, the public needs the public health system to be in better shape than it is. And it's definitely slowing down our response. We think that interoperability and data standards are critical. So is innovation. And so is recognizing that we're not trying to build one big monolithic system that can crash. We want to be investing in a smarter way that will be adaptive over time, but that will get us information earlier and with a workforce that can actually use data to predict problems rather than react uh, late. Do you have a timeline on when you think that plan would be completed and Madam Chair with your uh, support you know I think it'd be fascinating for this committee to hear that uh, once it's ready and we'd be happy to share with you the the where we are with it and then more more details about where we want to go thank you Just to, my, to my colleague yeah. if you yield for a second that's one of the reasons why we put in the hundred million dollars because we found and, and, and this turned up in, in most health crises we leave our states uh, at really at risk because we don't have a very substantial public health infrastructure nationwide. Again, which is one of the reasons why we buttressed that up uh, in, in, our, in our bill. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I wondered if uh, you could also talk a little bit about, because you know I've been reading different articles and I'm still trying to get a picture for what's actually happening here. Um, I'm assuming the lung injury is pretty similar in each case, or are there different types of lung injuries and infections, or what, how would you characterize what we're seeing? Yeah, we're still gathering the data. The clinical symptoms are fairly similar, that people develop shortness of breath, uh, cough, sometimes chest pain, sometimes fever, and about three-fourths of them have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms around the same time, nausea, vomiting, uh, stomach pains. Um, many progress to life-threatening difficulty breathing, where half of them are admitted to intensive care units, and um, about 20% need to be on a mechanical ventilator. The x-rays look like a, a, what we call bilateral, both sides of the lungs, um, diffuse infiltrate. That's very nonspecific. The te extra testing that's done doesn't show an infection, which would be common, the imaging, the x-ray, or chest CT shows uh, many different patterns that are diffuse. But what we're trying to do right now is look at pathology, look at the clinical specimens. And there are a couple different patterns that are being seen. I think it's too soon for us to know whether this is one substance causing a chemical reaction or multiple different kinds of substances in individual cases. And so that's why I say it may be multiple outbreaks on this common backdrop of the vaping or um, e-cigarette product use. And, and I recognize the challenge when you have illicit drugs being used and you aren't sure what someone is putting into the mix. Um, in cases where these are being sold legally, um, you had mentioned sometimes there's not full labeling or you know that it's there's a mystery there. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that um, you know state by state um, regulation of, of um, THC or marijuana will vary how the how the products are required to be um, tested and, and um, labeled. The um, e-cigarette products aren't right now approved by FDA, so there's really no requirements of what they have to say. So it's kind of uh, hard to know what's what's in them or what's produced by them. At least that's my understanding. 
The, um, and we, what we do know is that the aerosol that a nicotine-containing e-cigarette e can have will produce a lot of different compounds, not as many as combustible cigarettes, but there can be organic, volatile compounds, heavy metals like lead. You know, there's a device that's involved heated to high temperatures, very what, what they call ultra-fine particles, which has lung specialists worried because that's kind of like silica and silicosis. So we just, um, and then what we see with um, especially young people using e-cigarettes is they're using them all day. It's not like the old days where you had to go, you know, before school or after school they were smoking cigarettes. They're using them in class, in the bathrooms, all through the day. And so they're getting enormous amounts of that aerosol exposure. Um, and then similarly, we hear that the THC use is often quite frequent. So I think that the damage that the variety of, of substances might have on the lungs could be diverse. And then what we're really worried about with the outbreak is um, adulterants or cutting agents or solvents being used to increase the profit, um, you know, adding oil or other chemicals to the, um, the THC-containing cartridges that will make a, more of a product for the dealer, but really it's uncharted territory what that does when it's heated to high temperatures and is inhaled. Okay. And then uh, finally, we had um, uh, the NIH director Kotlins and a team from NIH uh, talking about the current scheduling of marijuana and, and the effect that that has on the research. Um, do you find, do you feel that it would be helpful to you to have uh, additional research on THC and in and, and this area? And is the scheduling of that interfering with some of that research? Well, we, we don't have um, specific funding for the THC work right now, um, so that might be more of a barrier for us than the scheduling. But um, the... Uh, you know, I share Dr. Collins' view that a lot more research is needed and that there are many questions that um, it would be helpful to understand. So the, the scheduling may have less impact on us because we're really just, we're essentially in our National Youth Tobacco Survey, we have a couple questions, and in our Behavioral Risk Factor Survey, we have a couple questions, but we're not um, uh, investing in research right now on, on marijuana or THC. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Congresswoman Roy Bellelli. Dr. Shukat, uh, thank you for being here today and, and for everything that CDC is doing uh, to identify and address the causes of lung illness and death associated with, uh, with vaping. I think uh, up to this point it's been well established that we are in a crisis situation. And so I'd like to uh, focus my questions on the resources that CDC is going to need in order to adequately address of this crisis. So first of all, I, I'd like to um, have you maybe elaborate on the strategies that CDC uh, is employing to address youth vaping behaviors, and what sort of resources do you need to be successful in this? Yes, thank you. We, um, we carry out much of our work through um, funding of the state and local tobacco control efforts um, through the public health departments. And they are stretched thin right now. They say about half of 50% or so of their resources are going towards youth issues. And that's inadequate in terms of the growing problem in youth and that we haven't finished the job in adults yet. Um, the, the approaches that are taken are a comprehensive program, which involves a variety of strategies. Mass media, which can include school-based school efforts, as long as they're not sort of industry-sponsored school-based efforts, but also things like our tip cam TIPS campaign or what um, the Truth Initiative is doing or FDA is doing targeted at youth. The, um, a, a second area is around price controls, which is, is certainly done by the states, not by us. Uh, a third area is um, smoke-free policies, and that that really can play a role in terms of reducing secondhand smoke or secondhand aerosol exposures, but also reinforcing quitting once people have quit and help people not start. Um, so um, those are the types of approaches. And I think the um, a, a key thing that CDC wants to do is monitor the data. You know, each state is tracking the, the youth tobacco use as well as adult use through, through other means. 
and having that data accessible quickly and uh, being able to adapt it to the newer threats. So those are the kinds of things we do um, with the resources. Um, but of course, in this response, we're also doing a, you know, a rapid fire incident management multi-state investigation, which involves epidemiology and laboratory and communication and policy, the international team I mentioned, as well as um, uh, data systems work. So, so I think we're, we're working on a lot of fronts right now, but with an increase in um, resources for tobacco, we would, we would very much want the states to be able to focus on expanding their youth activities. Uh, as was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, after years of relatively flat funding, the House FY20 uh, Labor HHS bill included a $40 million increase for CDC's Office of Smoking and Health. Uh, unfortunately, the Senate bill level funds OSH at $210 million. If the Senate level were to be approved, what activities would CDC not be able to undertake to stem this youth epidemic? Yeah, I mean, essentially, the states would be having to decide between children and adults, and that's not really a great option. We know that adult smokers, you know, 70% or more want to quit, and their access to cessation products and quit lines is really important, and that's a key thing that the states do. And we know that new young people taking up um, e-cigarette use is, you know, possibly leading to a life of addiction and harming the developing brain and increasing their risk for addiction to other substances. So um, it's really a terrible choice. But I think you can see in the numbers between the acute investigation and the rise in youth use of e-cigarettes that um, there's a growing problem and diminished resources would not help. Okay. Uh, can you tell how much of the current OSH budget uh, is dedicated to addressing the e-cigarette epidemic, and is that funding uh, being drawn from resources that would have otherwise been used to reduce the use of cigarettes and other tobacco products? Um, it, it's probably, because the states tell us about half is going towards youth, that's pretty much e-cigarette targeted right now. Um, and yes, that is drawing from the, the adult, re, the resources available for adults in terms of the, the quit lines and cessation uh, access and and so forth. So it's it's um, and you know having the ma the mass media campaigns can be quite expensive, and having ones that are targeted towards where youth get their information is is a different approach. So there, there's quite a lot to do right now. So uh, my understanding, the, the the large part of the burden is falling onto the states themselves. Uh, to do this, that, that's right. We they are not adequate. They don't have the adequate. That's right. Yeah, resources. That's right. Most of our resources go to the states directly or indirectly, um, and the uh, they're often um, in. They're they're quite they're stretched thin now. Some of them, you know, tobacco settlement resources are gone or not going. You know, going to the general fund, not towards their tobacco control programs. So. With this increase, you know, we thought we were making progress. Adult smoking was down, and even e-cigarette use was down. And then the last couple of years, it's starting to skyrocket. So the resources um, are are stretched thin, and we need to really redouble our efforts to to get um, the trends to to go back down. Thank you, Congresswoman Hayarba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, so I think our goal is to do of the hearing, at least the way I see it, is t we, want to we want ideas that are going to help us end not just the current outbreak, but address the underlying situation, right? Um, and we're just gathering information. I wanted to really quickly read a couple things that are now updated on the CDC website for our constituents to read. Quote, most patients report a history of using THC-containing products. There's another line. The latest findings suggest Products contain THC play a role in the outbreak. Next line. While this investigation is ongoing, CDC recommends that you consider refraining from using e-cigarettes or vaping products, particularly those containing THC. Another line. Anyone who uses e-cigarettes or vaping products should not buy these products from informal sources or off the street, right? Um, and then I guess my next thought, you know, is, you know, let's be very clear. No teen use of marijuana. Um, <laughs> It is legal anywhere, right? There's no regulated market for marijuana use for teenagers recreationally. Um, and THC is fed, still federally illegal everywhere, so we all know that. Um, and it's illegal in 39 states. 
you know, no THC vapor is legal for 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade use. Yet CDC's, your youth behavioral risk survey or surveillance system tells us almost 20% of youth have used marijuana in the last 30 days. Um, and then according to federal data, uh, the percentage of those kids vaping marijuana instead of smoking it or ingesting it is also going up. So this is the pool of kids I am most worried about. And yes, I'm worried about adults who want to, you know, get off of smoking. Absolutely. But when you're looking at investment and, and how do we put our money in, you know, stopping that expense on the back end in lives and in, in dollars, we need to we need to get at them now, especially as this is exploding. Um, you know, this has taken the lives of 20, at least 26 people where do we go? I was so concerned to hear that there's not research with regard to THC or marijuana use, especially the, the impacts of it at CDC. What do we need to do to help you get that research? Yes, thank you. I think that, I mean, I, I do think there's general agreement that youth should not be using THC or nicotine. And the scope of the problem is getting worse. The, the marijuana rates are probably kind of flat, but the exposure to these vaping devices that um, um, you know, allow for very discreet use may be, increase, may be changing the dynamic a little bit. Um, you know, CDC works really closely with both NIH and FDA on the tobacco issues and also on the substance issues. And so the research portfolio um, that NIH has um, we may be very supportive of exactly what research we are doing um, or would do with resources would need to be complementary. It would be less of the basic science kinds of, you know, lung pathology that they would be doing or addiction research that they do in the in NIDA and probably more of the behavioral mm -hmm. change um, marketing strategies that would help the, the state health departments get, um, you know, get their challenges met. Um, st the state health departments really want more help with marijuana as well as with, um, with nicotine. And is that something then, so addressing the, the behavioral or the, the way to communicate with young people, I'm just going to break it down. Right. That's mm -hmm. where, that would be more in your wheelhouse, yet you guys don't have necessarily any proposals for that? You're not requesting that? Or is that something... Um, we we aren't current. You know, we don't have a marijuana funding line through through your appropriations. We have um, uh, you know br broader you know broader lines that we use to support the the core work that we do. But we're not funded to do research on so, marijuana. And so we would have to specify that. I think so. Yeah. Uh, but we could probably get you more informed information um, after the hearing. Then I would about I would like particulars. to have it just because everybody keeps saying it's a problem. It's growing. And yet, no one can answer this question, and you're the CDC. Mm -hmm. That that baffles me. And it, my state's legalized; a number of states have for mm -hmm. recreational use. Mm -hmm. And yet, I don't even hear, "Hey, you guys aren't funding what we're asking you to do here." You're saying well, we haven't necessarily really even put it in our ask. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame you. I, I, I'm just saying that tells me we need to get this. We need. We're. I'm. I'm ready to help step up and get you what you need. But we need. You guys are the. You're the doctors and the researchers, mm, yeah. right? We need your help. Yeah, and we d we do hear from the the states across the country that more understanding of um, of the trends that are going on and um, the the risks and benefits and the uh, best approaches to the regulatory requirements that mm -hmm. they have would be helpful. So we we get a lot of requests from state health departments and their organizations. Well, now I have a request of you. I would love to have someone in your office come maybe meet with oh. us on how we could help facilitate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. I was on the clock. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Dr. Shukat, for being with us today. I had a question for you on the National Youth Tobacco Survey that showed a decline in e-cigarettes and then an increase in 2017, 2018. Do we know some of the reasons behind that increase? Yeah, the timing of the increase um, tracks pretty well with what we call the fourth generation e-cigarette device, and Juul is the sort of poster child for that. And those devices use nicotine salts, which um, are not as harsh as uh, plain old nicotine, and so the, the taste is, not, is, is more acceptable to young people first trying it. They had higher concentrations of available nicotine, and um, the device 
is quite small and can be put in your pocket or used discreetly so that kids could use them in school. Parents wouldn't know what they were. They looked like uh, USBs or, um, or highlighters and so forth. And so the huge uptake from um, 2017 to 18, and then again in the preliminary results for 19, really tracks with the market share of, of Juul just skyrocketing during that period. And do we have good data on the use of e-cigarettes in um, giving up smoking? Do we have data on the efficacy of that? No, there's um, emerging data, but there have just been three randomized control trials in terms of a cessation approach, and the data from those trials is mixed. The um, evidence basis, as um, uh, Chair DeLauro mentioned, from the National Academy of Medicine review said it's sort of mixed evidence at this point and not yet um, uh, recommended as a cessation approach. And not none of the uh, e-cigarettes have um, FDA approval to be used for cessation. There are seven different FDA approved cessation tools that are that are you know have gone through full review. So um, there's there's mixed data there in the U.S. not. Um, you know, we're a data-driven, evidence-based organization, and we'd love to see data. But um, at, at this point, that data hasn't been pulled together. You know, it's alarming to hear you talk about these ultra-fine particles mm -hmm. that, um, even though it may be less toxins uh, than in combustible cigarettes, but um, how long, uh, if you can answer such a general question, how long does it take for us to see those kind of what we saw with asbestos showing up in lung disease from usage like this, or do we do we have any idea? Yeah, there's so much um, research that's needed. I think that um, actually CDC's National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health has done a lot of work on lung diseases, including you know silicosis and asbestosis and so forth. And in fact, the popcorn lung that we were hearing about before, with the same chemical that's in in some of these flavors. Um, so, you know, we're really in a, we're used to studying these things occupationally because of the high doses that people used to get as workers when they weren't using respiratory protection, but we don't really have the same kind of science yet on young people doing sort of 24-7 vaping of high doses of fine particles into the depths of their lungs. And I think this outbreak of lung injury is showing us that some damage can happen really fast depending on what the substance is in terms of the, um, the, the um, e nicotine e-cigarette devices and the harms they may have over time. I don't think we have that, that data yeah. yet. And one of my concerns using um, a uh, small focus group of my teenage sons and their friends is that there is a growing, um, well, you know, if you're not using THC, this is still perfectly fine. So we need to get those education pieces out, and you've talked a lot about the infrastructure, and I know you have a report coming, but can you give us some specific supports that we could give you around educating the public where sort of we're breaking down in the public health infrastructure on this? Yeah, the um, it is, I think that teens definitely have that impression that yeah. there's no problem, it's not a cigarette, it's not, they don't recognize there's nicotine, they don't often have any idea that, that it's harmful. And the salts um, are have higher levels of nicotine? Yeah, the, the salts can make a higher level available, yeah. and a one pot of Juul is like a full pack of, it's like 20 cigarettes. So, and people, you know, may go through a pot a, a, a day or every other day. And, you know, as I, as I said, they can be using them in class, like, you know, whenever the teacher turns her back or his back, you know, is uh, they're using these products and, you know, slip it in your pocket and you have no idea what's going on. So it's, um, you know, the, the level of use may be quite high. So I think there's a lot of work to do. Now, the um, FDA has a campaign called The Real Cost, which is really aimed at youth, and the um, Truth Initiative has a youth-targeted campaign. But I think there's a lot more we need to do that, you know, we know that, that some of the companies have gotten, you know, youth influencers and very, very uh, sophisticated youth-targeted advertising to get people hooked, and we have to counter that. Thank you. Congresswoman Lee. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for this very important hearing. I apologize for being late. So if I ask, if these questions are re redundant, uh, just say so and I'll uh, move on. But I, um, this is such an important issue um, that uh, so many communities have been grappling with. And so I just wanted to ask just a couple of really just basic cut through the smoke questions. Uh, in terms of just e-cigarettes, uh, are they safe to be used right now? Um, we don't think there's any safe tobacco product. So e-cigarettes containing nicotine um, should never be used by youth, young adults, or pregnant women, or by adults who aren't um, previously tobacco users. The developing brain through age 25 um, can be harmed by nicotine, and the individuals using nicotine at young ages may have a higher risk of progressing to combustibles and also to other uh, to addiction to other substances. So there's populations where nicotine-containing e-cigarettes are just absolute no's, but um, in general, we don't think there is any safe tobacco product. Well, if they're not safe, then uh, why uh, is there not a complete ban? until we figure out what's causing these uh, negative health outcomes? Well, the CDC doesn't have the regulatory role. Um, you and, can recommend. Right, So, and that's where what we've said is that um, there are groups that should never be using e-cigarettes, and those are you know youth, young adults up to age 25, pregnant women. Um, there's a, a lot of debate. Uh, out there about adults who want to use these cigarettes as a safer, quote, alternative to cigarettes. We're worried that a whole generation is starting e-cigarette use that was never going to go on to using e-cigarettes, yeah. and we don't want, you know, an off-ramp for adults to be an on-ramp for kids. Yeah. And if if there's you know a sufficient data for them to be used for cessation, you know, that could go through the process to, for approval. I, yeah, I understand that, but and and I'm happy that you all are raising the alarm, but I don't see any policy recommendation coming to us saying the Congress should ban the use of e-cigarettes for the following reasons. Yeah. So again, we're not the regulatory no, body, recom but recommendation, the, yeah, right? But the, based yeah, on the and, and data so, that you have right now, right? And so, based on the data, um, the administration has proposed um, to enforce the uh, regulatory um, authorities they have in terms of non-tobacco flavored e-cigarettes, and really to require, um, you know, none of the products are considered legal or authorized yet, but that hasn't been enforced, and they're proposing to enforce that um, with sure, But this plans. has been going on for a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah. So it's time for you all to speak out and say mm. something, that they should be banned for the, for the list of reasons you just enunciated. Mm. Yes, and we've been saying, you know, young adults, teens, uh, pregnant women should not use e-cigarettes, and adults who haven't... I understand that, but I'm just saying, yeah. I believe it, this does not take you out of your lane if mm. you make a recommendation, a public health recommendation, that we should establish a policy to ban them. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, and so I, I would just keep saying that no tobacco product is safe, and the more we can get uh, people not to use these, the better. But um, it's not working. Yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. I yield the balance back. I'm just saying on, on one point. It, the FDA at the moment has the authority. They have refused, both in the last administration and this administration, not to exercise that authority for a pre-market review, which would make a determination as to the safety of the product. CDC, we had the, the conversation before, recommendations. I concur with my colleague. A Congresswoman Lee, it needs to be maybe heightened, strengthened, et cetera, to provide the recommendation that tells them that until we uh, have the data, the information is, let's get the product off the market. Thank you very much, and I apologize. I missed your testimony before, but we have another committee I was in. Um, and thank you, Doctor, for being here. I have a couple of questions uh, that really revolve first around the lung injury issue. And one thing that came to mind is is that my understanding is that in the UK, as you know, um, 
they believe that access to vaping actually helps in the decrease in the use of combustible uh, tobacco products, and it's been around a while there. Have they seen the same issue in the UK? I mean, they have nationalized health system. They should have centralized data collection. In their system, it actually should be much easier to detect this early. What's the UK experience? Um, our conversations with the UK do not reveal the lung injury outbreak presentations. However, their um, products are different than ours. Uh, my understanding is that the e-cigarettes in the UK are limited to a 20 milligram uh, level, and ours are at a much higher level currently with the latest generation of nicotine salts. And, and what about the use of THC-containing compounds in the UK? That I, I'm not familiar with, but we could try to get you that later. My understanding is that, that on Friday, the indication was that, that there is the belief that this is linked to the use of THC-containing substances. The not, not the level of nicotine. It's not whether right, it's the latest. Or the latest yeah. lung injury outbreak data in the U.S. suggests that the vast majority have used THC. A lot of them also have used nicotine containing, and about 13 percent of cases in the U.S. report only having used nicotine containing devices. Right, and in fact, in your testimony, I think you say that one third of youth who use, who vape, actually use THC containing substances. One third of youth who use nicotine containing e cigarettes also use THC in their devices. So, so, and, and how, what percent of youth are using nicotine devices? Uh, the latest, the preliminary data for this year is that it's more than a quarter. More than a quarter of current and of those, use. So, current a use. third of those mm -hmm. actually are using marijuana derivatives in, the, in their. I mean, that, that's how device. widespread the use of these marijuana derivatives are among our youth based on the data that we have. Wow. So when we're told that it's okay to make, you know, recreational marijuana legal because don't worry, it's not going to, you know, we're not going to let children use it. The indication is just like with e-cigarettes, children are using it. We don't have a great track record of keeping things away, away from, from children. Teenagers. And in fact, it appears that it's actually uh, killing our children in some cases, right? Because some people die of the lung injury. The, They're rare, but they do. Yes, we've had um, yes, we've had more than two dozen deaths so far, and we continue to hear about new deaths. Right. So uh, I, I look, I agree because one of your uh, one of your conclusions actually, we probably ought to study the use of uh, marijuana a little bit more before we go willy nilly and uh, and make it available recreationally uh, throughout the country. And and I would say, do you think this is one instance where, in fact, the unbridled and according to federal law, illegal use of marijuana for recreational purposes, I'm assuming the people who vape, the, the youth who vape, are not doing it for medical reasons. Is that what you're finding, or are you, are you looking into that? Because there's a big discussion about medical versus recreational. Yeah. Well, are these 8% are these or 9%, are they using it because they, you know, they have you know, the usual indications that people claim for medical marijuana, or are they just using it recreationally? What's your feeling, Doc? Yeah, we, we don't have data. There's a lot of anecdote. Um, but one thing I would say is that um, there's a lot of debate out there about whether reg, uh, legal, legal status makes things better or worse in the states because some of our concerns right now are about the counterfeit and black market, whether the substances that are in products that are completely unregulated by the states are riskier than the products that are regulated by the states. I don't think we have good data either way, but that's a, a discussion that's that's happening. So are states regulating the THC containing vaping compounds? The where it's legal, they have they they you know inspect the dispensaries. It's it, every state has to set up their own plan on how they're going to do the regulation. So uh, is the feeling that the states have gone ahead, basically approving these THC containing substances through regulation when they were basically unhealthy. They basically didn't have the scientific information about whether this was safe, but they were approving these compounds. Is that right? I mean, they, they were legally sold. Is that what you're saying? They were legally sold. They ended up hurting our children. And these are when the states claim that, don't worry, it's all safe. You know, we'll regulate it. We don't have the knowledge to know what's safe and what isn't, do we? Yeah. Let, let me clarify. For the lung injury outbreak, while the vast majority report using THC-containing um, pre-filled cartridges, um, they report getting them from informal sources or off the street, not necessarily from licensed dispensaries. Even in states that have. Yeah, so far channels. that's what we found. Thank but you. that, but we're Thank still you. gathering data. Thank you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Just a point, and I shared with, with with my colleague. This is about UK. 
and I think we need more information there, about this estimate that 95 percent, uh, that e-cigarettes are 95 percent safer than cigarettes first gained prominence. That was in 2015. But there are, the claim has very ser serious limitations. It's an educated guess among a small group of contributors, not based on thorough evidence or scientific risk analysis. I think the whole issue of what is out there and risk analysis and the whole issue of scientific data is critical uh, to this debate. Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you very much for being here. And I, uh, like Ms. Lee, apologize for not being here for the testimony. I have three hearings at the exact same time, and the one I went to earlier was about our congressional schedules. So um, <laughs> we're trying to fix that in modernization, so kind of ironic, but I thought I'd mention that. Um, to the very last point you said, I, I think you've made a, a very strong case um, for why we want to have legal regulation of marijuana. We already have it in many states. Uh, the problem is, in fact, in my hometown of Kenosha, Wisconsin, it was one of the national cases, the two kids, uh, and by kids they were early 20s, um, who were retrofitting these devices for marijuana, and that's the problem. It's people, because we don't have proper regulation in Wisconsin, because we're going to apparently be one of the last states to do any kind of um, legalizing and having regulation around marijuana, that's what's killing people. And so I think, you know, the strong case was made by um, our colleague from Maryland about, you know, why we should actually have legal marijuana everywhere because that way we can have the proper regulation on it. But specifically, I, I missed the one part. I know you said since the moment you heard about uh, what was going on at CDC, you've been working on this 24 hours a day. When did you start working on this? Just I don't know that. Yeah, we, we were first alerted about a small cluster in Wisconsin on August 1st. Okay. And we learned soon thereafter about what sounded like similar cases in Illinois. Those two states started to collaborate and um, issued an alert for other states. And by mid-August, we had engaged in a multi-state investigation, dispatched people to Wisconsin and Illinois to assist them in their investigation and, and um, in instituted a coordinated response. We've ratcheted up and now uh, have had more than 200 CDC staff involved in the response so far, um, but this, every state health department is working vigorously on this. Uh, th and thank you. And I think you know that was right on the state line that particular case we're talking about. So I think it had um, a little overlap in both of those areas. You know, this is one I was trying to find an article I read earlier today. But you know, um, the FDA for 10 years hunted did nothing in this area. And um, the chairwoman of this committee, actually Ms. Lowy, was one of the first people every time we had this issue up, talked about what she was hearing from her grandchildren. And, you know, hearing about, you know, her great-grandchildren, I'm sorry, about the stories about what was going on and really put it more in our awareness. And, you know, one of the issues that I've been surprised, and I don't know if this is something you can take on since the FDA apparently is not, but people are getting around the law and advertising these products. So I've had constituents actually send me an ad, and honestly, it was geared towards a high school crowd. It was not geared towards uh, <clears throat> people who are watching Downton Abbey. Uh, it was um, you know, people worrying about Downtown Abbey, maybe, right? It's a little different sort of uh, audience. And they're really circumventing, I think, what both you know policymakers and agencies always tried to stop uh, in this area. Are you going to be able to look at that issue at all? I know there's a bill introduced around this, but I think this is one of the problems. Yeah, we, we don't take the enforcement actions around advertising to youth, but we do um, study, you know, what is what is out yeah. there. And I think you're, you're absolutely right that there has been a, a lot of clear youth targeted um, strategies to get people hooked on e-cigarettes, you know, whether it's Social influencers or digital, you know, digital campaigns that don't don't have the name of a company on them. You know, looking back, that's what you can find, and they're clearly not for that middle-aged smoker who's trying to quit, but really for uh, you know a teen or a tween who doesn't even know what's in the e-cigarette. And we know that clearly from the flavors as well and things like that. So the uh, also in this article was interesting, and they said there's some specific things that are actually worse than cigarette smoking to a body because of how it comes in. Can you address, have you looked at some of that? Because this article talked specifically about the intake through vaping that actually is more likely to cause disease and addiction. Yeah, the, um, the latest generation of e-cigarette of e devices use um, nicotine salts 
and those are less harsh, so they're more palatable for for folks who have not used tobacco before, and um, they can make very high levels of tobacco of nicotine um, accessible, including to the brain, which is developing in a teenager. The f flavors that are used are um, uh, very appealing to youth, and part of the the strategy they're sort of the ads, then the flavor, and then the nicotine, which is the addictive piece. The um, aerosol that's produced from these e-cigarettes can include heavy metals like lead, volatile organic compounds that can be, you know, really nasty. Um, uh, cutting agents can be used that are, you know, essentially toxins. Um, and there's also, we were talking, talking about it briefly, ultrafine particles that when they deposit in the lungs may, and you use, you know, you have high exposure over time, they may eventually give us something like a, a, a chronic lung condition like silicosis or asbestosis. So those are the kinds of lung problems that we're facing, and you're really not expecting, you know, a 13 or 15 or 17-year-old to be doing things that are going to turn their lungs into that of an 80-year-old. I think they even mentioned eyes, too, and something with arsenic, if I remember right, or there's some there, other aspect. We don't even know. So okay. there's, you know, CDC has um, a, sm a smoking lab that is now studying aerosols from some of these. And I think there's, you know, they haven't really gone through the reviews that you would need to do. Um, and the animal studies are, are concerning. So I, th I think that's where um, the, the effect on the human. Unfortunately, we have a, a generation that's being experimented on right now. Thank you. Thank you. We, we are going to now move to our, our second panel, but I, I think for, for, for all of us, I just wanted to say, Dr. No, oh, oh, I thought you had. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you very much. I'm so sorry I've been here. Um, but I asked my, my staff for a question, and it was, what, do we know what the FDA is doing? Do you know what the FDA is doing? to uh, look at the danger or the perceived danger of uh, these e-cigarettes with marijuana lace, without marijuana lace, with, with sweetenings and without sweetenings? Well, well, I can comment on two things that the FDA is doing. One thing is the um, aggressive collaboration as part of this outbreak of lung injury where they and their um, investigators in states are collecting products for testing, testing a variety of things, the product, the device, the, um, the components, which may or may not have been expected, sort of looking for those cutting agents and so forth, and that they have announced as part of the administration's announcement in September that they intend to be issuing guidance related to enforcement of the non-tobacco flavored um, uh, uh, pre-market approval process. So those are the, the two areas, um, and CDC is collaborating on the testing of the errors. That was the other thing. I was going to wonder if they were going to be benefiting from the kind of research that you all are doing and findings that you were doing. Yes, we're working very closely with them, um, as well as with the National Cancer Institute. We have a, a tri-agency group that is um, focused on um, sharing our results as well as coordinating the research and the, the campaigns and so forth. And did I understand you say that they will be come out with some recommendations and findings with regard to the to the non um, the non tobacco flavors? That's what they announced that um, that um, the non flavors flavors other than tobacco. So there's they actually have a tobacco flavored e cigarette, and they're not intending to issue guidance related to that, but for all of the other flavors, that's what they announced they were going to be developing guidance for, because they hadn't yet enforced that guidance, or enforce, enforced that regulatory authority that they already have. But is it, but is it tobacco? It, um, it, it's for the tobacco, it, yes, it's for the is nicotine. Is that not a danger? Is that not yeah, it a is, possible danger um, as well? Well, I think the, the idea is they're all potentially dangerous, but that the non-tobacco flavors are particularly attractive to young people. Um, you know, candy, popcorn, right. uh, bubble uh, gum. I, yeah, as we move forward and had the cigarette industry be more aggressive in its cautionaries, either on the pack or in the advertisements or whatever, um, it just seems to me that this is a new, this is an alternative that we 
that has been presented and we need to be as aggressive in making sure that people don't get addicted or exposed as much as possible. Thank you, thank you, I yield back. Scientific, you, you know, uh, making it as easy as possible for uh, us to, uh, to understand and, uh, and obviously our continued conversations about recommendations. Uh, we will say that like the, um, um, I, I know you're in the business of making recommendations. I think we all want to see the recommendations as strong as possible, that they translate into uh, real action. Uh, by the uh, the FDA, which is the regulatory agency. Um, I, I'm just going to ask the second panel to come up and say thank you to you so very, very much, Dr. Strzokin. I would like to say to my colleague while we're changing that the FDA currently has the authority. They did not take on this authority uh, to deal with a pre-market review, either in the last administration or this administration. We would have then been able to know the scientific uh, difficulties or the positive side of these products and therefore and also the FDA to my colleague who asked about advertising they regulate the advertising as well they are a regulatory agency and quite frankly in my view they have abdicated that responsibility thank you Good morning, and thank you very, very much um, uh, uh, for being here this morning. Uh, we will uh, proceed to opening statements uh, from our panelists, including uh, Renee Coleman-Mitchell, who is a commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Public Health. As I mentioned earlier, it was great to have you join me at Yale New Haven Hospital in September uh, to talk about the public health crisis. And it's wonderful to have you with us today. If I also might add, we want to welcome not only you, but we want to welcome your family who was here today, your son, your daughter, your husband. Really, welcome. Uh, I know how proud you are of this lady. She is, she is terrific. Uh, we have also with us Dr. Sally Sattel, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher, professor of pediatrics at Stanford University, executive director of the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit, and Meredith Berkman, co-founder of Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. Uh, public health crisis, again, thank you for being here. We look forward to the discussion. Uh, Commissioner, your full written testimony will be entered into the hearing record. You are recognized for five minutes. Go for it. Good morning, Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come before you today with great concern for all our victims who have been misled and misinformed about the human health risk of vaping. As a state health official, I am deeply alarmed by the outbreak of severe lung illnesses and deaths associated with vaping. This is a public health emergency with serious consequences. I know you join me in expressing our heartfelt sympathy to the families who have lost loved ones. In Connecticut so far, we have 31 cases and one death, but any death is too many. As Dr. Shuket indicated today, we still do not know what is causing the lung disease outbreak among e-cigarette users, but public health is working tirelessly in partnership with our federal, state, and local partners to investigate this illness fully so that we can work better to protect the lives of Americans. What we do know, however, is vaping and e-cigarette products are highly addictive and are unsafe. The younger the age of initiation, the harder it is to stop using these products. Connecticut managed to reduce the high school youth uh, combustible cigarette use rate to less than 4% by 2017. By implementing such best practices, which included enacting a clean India air law, levying a high excise tax rate, and providing youth education on smoking. However, the increase in vaping that has overtaken our trend, the Connecticut Youth Tobacco Survey shows that our overall rate of e-cigarette use among all high school students was 14.7% in 2017. For high school seniors, the rate is 24.4% in 
nearly one in four. This is one of the most frustrating facts when it comes to vaping. After decades of work, we've substantially decreased youth tobacco use. We were headed in the right direction. But with aggressive marketing campaigns, touting interesting flavors, and pitching e-cigarettes as safe alternatives to smoking, youth nicotine use is once again on the rise. I want you to take a quick look at a graph that we have. Are we able to pull it up? And if we're not, I'm just going to have to summarize it. All right. The bottom line is that you have seen over time, it's comparing Connecticut youth cigarette use versus e-cigarette use among youth. And it was cigarette use gradually went from 25.6% in 2000 to 3.5% in 2017 versus e-cigarettes at 2.4% in 2011 and now at 14.7% in 2017. It shows you what we're up against. Here in the declining number of young people in Connecticut reporting use of combustible tobacco products. And just in the last couple of years, while the introduction of e-cigarettes and vaping, nicotine use is up sharply among our young people. Oh, here's the graph. And again, what I really just want to emphasize is that you saw over a time, this was between 2000 and two, uh, 2018, it's a gradual progression down in terms of overall youth cigarette use. But look at the trajectory regarding e-vaping, e-cigarettes and vaping from 2000 to 2017. Look at that. That is alarming because it's going straight sky high. Excuse that pun. With the introduction of e-cigarettes and vaping, nicotine use is up sharply among our young people. This has wiped out all our gains we made in reducing tobacco use among young people. We were using all available resources to address the use of e-cigarettes, vaping products, and the lung disease outbreak. Specifically, on September of this year, I authorized the amendment to the list of reportable diseases by adding unexplained vaping-related injuries. As of October 1st of this year, Connecticut passed T21 legislation, which raised the minimum age from 18 to 21 years of age to purchase all tobacco, e-cigs, and vaping products. We continue to amend our Indoor Clean Air Act, which we now can proudly say it's 24-7 in regards to prohibiting smoking indoors, workplaces, but also our school grounds and all of our daycare facilities. We have put a tax on vaping products. We are encouraging our residents to use our quit line. We are also getting the word out on media. We are using, as a state health department, personnel from our infectious disease section, our tobacco prevention section, from our injury section, our toxicologists, and our state lab. We are using their expertise to interview the cases at the data, looking at the data, involving our tobacco prevention program to enhance our messaging and education programming. These resources are being used for three things, investigating the cases, the completion of the case reports, and for the transmission of that data to CDC. The greatest danger we face is that vaping-related vaping lung illnesses are not only an outbreak, but may in fact become an endemic or costly chronic disease. I'm going to have to summarize. Due to the time, it comes down to this. The question I ask, do you want to wait another 50 years to combat the vaping epidemic? We need to act now. Otherwise, we run the risk of losing a whole generation to severe costly illness, or even worse, what we already have experienced, death. Thank you. Dr. Sattel. Thank you, Chairwoman DeLauro. Ranking Member Cole and the subcommittee for inviting me. Um, I'm an addiction psychiatrist, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and a lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine, where I did my residency and was an assistant professor. Uh, I want to talk about nicotine vapor, uh, vaping by smokers as a public health asset, but I'll start by briefly addressing the recent outbreak of pulmonary illness and mortality. Crucially, the vast majority of patients, as Dr. Shuckett was telling us, with respiratory failure appear to have used underground uh, adulterated cannabis vape cartridges, vitamin E, acetate oil, pesticides, and so on. These things cause extreme resp um, inflammatory responses that can actually be life-threatening. And that's why the FDA has been warning people to, quote, stop using THC vaping products. But the FDA has issued no such warning on us users of commercial nicotine vaping products. Now, I'll refer to them as e-cigarettes from, from now on. 
Uh, so while the current rash of lung illnesses and fatalities is a very serious problem, it's not a problem that will be solved through bans involving commercial. Now, it could be that counterfeit e-cigarettes are causing some problems, but uh, they won't be solved by bans involving commercial e-cigarette products because those haven't been implicated as a cause. But moving on to smokers. To be unmistakably clear, the only permissible consumers of e-cigarettes are smokers, period. But uh, kids don't know that, and one in four, as we've heard, have reported vaping at least once within the last month, and a minority actually vape considerably more than that. If candy and fruit flavors no longer existed, the, the policy rationale goes, kids would be deterred, and I suspect that's true of a lot of them. The problem is, though, that those bans will harm adult smokers, and they need flavors. Those flavors are the reason they were able to switch from cigarettes to a much less risky activity. And their preferred flavors are fruit. And if they can't get those fruit-flavored products, many will have two really bad options. They can go to Walmart, where cigarettes will now be, e-cigarettes will now be banned, but the shelves will be stocked with cigarettes so that they may now resume smoking, a much more deadly alternative. Or they can head to the new black market in flavored vapes. And we've already seen what black markets can do. In the end, it's difficult, if, if not impossible, to make vaping less appealing to kids by banning flavors without simultaneously making it more difficult for smokers to quit cigarettes with this safer alternative. And I feel I need to repeat safer because in, it's, in all this anxiety, much of it uh, warranted uh, about teen vaping and certainly about the deaths, I think we've lost this powerful truth that e-cigarettes, again, do not combust tobacco. That means no smoke, no carcinogenic tar produced. Are they safe? Nope. No one says they're safe, but they're safer. They do emit toxins. E-cigarette aerosol does have some toxins and some trace metals, but they emit far fewer in number uh, found, than found in cigarette smoke, and those that are present exist at a much lower level. The National Health Service in England, which actually has relied considerably on data, and I'm happy to pr provide that, is so confident of the relative safety. It estimates at 95, others have estimated perhaps 90, even 80 percent, but they've estimated at 95. And hospitals within the National Health Service have, sh have vape shops within them. This is their uh, anti-smoking month called Stoptober, and they've promoted vaping. In, uh, in the U.S., vaping is the most popular and successful product for quitting smoking. I have data on that, uh, ref uh, references to that in my testimony, written testimony. Do scientists need to follow vapors for many years out, decades? Definitely. We need to know the possible long-term effects of inhaling a cigarette aerosol. In closing, though, we cannot allow the vaping issue to become a contest between the health of teens and the health of smokers. We can and must protect teens, and we can and must protect smokers. Not through flavor bans, which will lead, lead many to return to smoking, which is the, probably the deadliest uh, consumer product there is, and will also lead to a market for dangerous counterfeits. We must pursue a very aggressive series of barriers, Tobacco 21 being the first. There are others in my uh, testimony, that, uh, written testimony. I'll close by saying uh, e-cigarettes are, are not a threat. They're an invaluable option for improving smokers' health, adult smokers' health, the ones who have already switched and the 36 million who are still smoking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Halpern Felsher. Thank you, Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and other members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak with you on this important and urgent topic on youth e-cigarette use. I'm a developmental psychologist with additional training in adolescent and young adult health, and my research, prevention, and policy work for the past 25 years has focused on factors involved in youth tobacco use. As you know, we have seen an unprecedented number of youth using and addicted to e-cigarettes, with this largely due to Juul, which accounts for 70 to 80 percent of the e-cigarette market share. But I would actually argue that these statistics are underestimates. I go around the country speaking to students, parents, and educators 
all of whom tell me that 50 to 75 percent of the students in their schools are using e-cigarettes. Whether the numbers truly are 27% or 75% or somewhere in between, we clearly have a vaping youth epidemic, and I would call it a jewel epidemic. Importantly, there is absolutely no difference in e-cigarette use among adolescents based on sex, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or geographic region. Let me emphasize this, regardless of income, it's easy for youth to obtain e-cigarettes legally and illegally through friends, on the internet, and through other means. So why am I concerned about e-cigarettes? Well, first, let's discuss nicotine. As you heard earlier, unlike cigarettes and many e-cigarette products, they use ammonia and sugars to enhance the delivery and absorption of nicotine to the body. But Juul has patented a salt-based nicotine whereby benzoic acid is added to change the pH level of the product to help deliver more nicotine to the brain faster with less throat hit, making it more appealing and more addictive to youth. Moreover, while earlier versions of e-cigarettes had between 0 and 36 milligrams of nicotine per milliliter, Juul and other newer pod-based products have at least 59 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine. Now, you may hear that that translates to about one pack of cigarettes, but actually in our lab, we've looked at it and done some research and the math to show that it's actually more like the nicotine found in one and a half to two packs of cigarettes. It's therefore no wonder, given the amount and the type of nicotine that we have, that we're seeing more and more youth using and addicted to these products. Second, aside from or really in addition to the current concern over the vaping-related lung illnesses and deaths that we've heard about today that may or may not be caused by nicotine e-cigarettes, there's clear evidence that the flavorants and other chemicals that are in nicotine e-cigarettes cause lung, heart, and other health problems. Third, schools are heavily impacted. Schools are spending an enormous amount of time, money, and resources directly uh, related to the e-cigarette epidemic. Schools are not equipped to handle the number of students caught using e-cigarettes, nor can they provide addiction treatment services due to legal and or staffing constraints. And yet schools are frantically trying to find ways to help prevent and reduce use of e-cigarettes in their schools and their communities. The demand for our toolkit, for example, increased dramatically in the past two years. In 2018, we trained about 730 educators to use our prevention toolkit. In just the first nine months of 2019, we've already trained over 1,500 educators, and we have reached well over a million students in the past two years. Fourth, there's a, a significant impact of e-cigarette e use on non-using students. Youth are frustrated by the constant disruptions of students using e-cigarettes, the disciplinary actions needed, and concerns over peers who use e-cigarettes having diminished athletic and academic abilities. Finally, as was said earlier, we have absolutely no data to inform e-cigarette cessation for youth. There are no nicotine replacement therapies or other medicines approved by the FDA for anybody under 18. So action is really needed now, including eliminating flavored tobacco products, including mint and menthol, raising taxes to ensure that e-cigarette devices and e-liquids have the same price point as other tobacco products, enacting a nicotine standard that applies to e-cigarettes and all tobacco products, prohibiting the marketing of e-cigarettes as well as product placements, celebrity sponsorships, and so on, prohibiting coupons, other promotional materials, and regulating the products. The FDA has the authority to do these now, including pulling these products off the market. So finally, in conclusion, there is an urgent need for education, prevention, and cessation programs in schools for parents and for healthcare providers. It's important to note that such strategies should not be conducted by the tobacco or e-cigarette companies, as there's been a history of these companies providing ineffective and often inappropriate, misleading, and harmful messages to youth. I look forward to discussing this more. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now recognize Ms. Berkman, and your full testimony will be entered into the hearing record and recognized for five minutes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me, um, Chair, uh, Chairwoman 
Deloro, Chairwoman Lowy, Ranking Member Cole, and other distinguished members of this, commun of this committee. My name is Meredith Berkman, and I am a co-founder of Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes, PAVE, a national grassroots advocacy group founded by three concerned moms as a response to the youth vaping epidemic. And as we all know, this is the most serious adolescent public health crisis our country has faced in decades. We've all heard the staggering latest federal figures, five million teens vaping, a 135% increase in over two years in youth use, one out of every four high school students. It's the eternal kid exaggeration, the proverbial everybody's doing it, but sadly this time it is more or less true. FDA allowed flavored e-cigs like Juul, especially Juul, to remain on the market even until today without undergoing full regulatory review. These products we know contain enormous amounts of nicotine that harm our kids' developing brains, and they are a toxic cocktail of known toxins, degraded metals from the devices themselves, and unknown toxins in the proprietary flavors. So we really have no idea what millions of our kids have been pulling so deeply into their precious developing lungs all day long and all night long, 24 seven. In some cases, kids have been doing this for years. The current outbreak of vaping-linked pulmonary illness is terrifying, but really it is not surprising. Now, I am not a doctor, I am not a public health expert, but I am a volunteer parent advocate. And we know that these symptoms have been going on for years because we hear about them. And so the underlying crisis is the youth vaping epidemic that has harmed so many kids across the country and upended the lives of so many families, of entire families. I wanna very briefly share with you my story the reason that I'm sitting here today. In April of 2018, one night, my son Caleb, then 16, came home and said, Mom, Dad, his dad is over my shoulder, I want to talk to you. And if you are a parent of teenagers, as I am with four of them, you know you never hear that. And so when you do, you listen. And my son began to tell us about what he referred to as a very confusing e-cigarette presentation that he'd heard at school that day, given by a speaker who was brought in through an outside anti-addiction group. When the teachers were out of the room, the educator repeatedly told the ninth graders that while Juul was intended for adults, it was totally safe, and that the FDA would be approving this product any moment. Both things are untrue. At the end of the talk, my son went up to the speaker, who, uh, to ask more questions, he took out his jewel, showed my son and his friends how it worked, and referred to it as the iPhone of vapes. It turns out he was a jewel rep and that the school had no idea. It was the realization that jewel was blatantly going after kids in their own schools, in their safe haven, that motivated me and my friends to take action. And we learned more and more about the predatory practices of Juul in particular, but others as well. The use of flavors, always flavors, young looking influencers, targeted social media marketing done in places where we adults, we parents, we teachers were not going. And that's why we started our group. Since then, we've gone national with our Pave Pods, an intended pun on Jules flavored pods, um, in more than a dozen states and growing, including states like New York, California, Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. But we're getting bigger because we represent a movement, a growing army of volunteer advocates, motivated mom advocates, I like to say, though also some dads, of course, fighting to protect our kids from these tech-chic, spelt-by-design flavored vapes, the latest incarnation of big tobacco. Some of these co companies are so brazen, they are marketing to kids on the internet, on school websites like Quizlet. My seventh grader saw a vape ad on, a, on an app game that she and her friends like called Flippy Verds. But we cannot allow big tobacco to use our kids as human guinea pigs. We know we're in a race against time, as I am now, uh, on multiple levels. And so I very briefly wanted to say, we need help. We want to partner with the CDC. We want to partner with you. There is a huge disconnect 
between what the public understands and knows and what the, the important work of the CDC in coordination with the FDA. There should be an interagency task force, not just a CDC task force. There should be a central reporting portal. There should be a, a central information portal, vapingillness.gov. There must be a massive social media marketing campaign that is the opposite of, of what Juul and its copycats did, right? a media campaign that uses influencers, the Surgeon General, and athletes and celebrities, that tells kids and their parents that this is the emergency. Yes, God forbid, more people will die and more people will get sick, but we all must have known this was coming. And now it's here. And if we don't solve the problem now, we will have, as everyone has said, an entire generation of nicotine addicts or worse. We need your help. We need more funding and more education, more prevention work. Thank you so much. Thank you all very, very much for very compelling uh, testimony. Before I ask a couple of questions, I just want you to know that we are trying to move here. The Judiciary Committee just passed. I mentioned earlier a piece of legislation that I've been pushing over the years is preventing online sales of e-cigarettes to Children Act, and they did it by voice vote. That means that we've got bipartisan support for this uh, for this effort. So, um, thank you for your advocacy in these in these areas, uh, uh, Commissioner. Let me ask you these questions. Um, I mean, we, you've talked about the rising rates in Connecticut. You went through uh, all of, all, all of that, uh, and that e-cigarettes are now the most common form of tobacco amongst high schoolers. Um, how is it impacting public health in Connecticut? How does it impact the schools? Um, and if you can then just mention the challenges that you face uh, while you're investigating the outbreak and how you collaborate with CDC, federal partners, um, and what additional resources do you need? It's a loaded question, but I will attempt Go to make it. sure I can <laughs> answer it the best of my ability. You can do it. Um, I have to say that, um, as I shared in my testimony, that it takes a number of resources from varying sections within the department. I share that our tobacco program, you know, our infectious disease, our, our state lab, um, these are individuals that are working on tirelessly, right, on all different types of public health matters. And then we pull, pull them together to say, here we have now vaping-related lung diseases, and it's just the resources are very scarce in regards to staff resources and funding. Right now in Connecticut, our tobacco prevention program has been level funded at about $874,000, and then we get an additional pot, which comes up to be about $1 million. That's a staff of about four people who really are spread quite thin throughout the state to really focus on working with colleges and universities and having the train the trainer aspect or working with uh, schools, high schoolers, um, in terms of training them. Also with the colleges, we're trying now to have counseling done because it is so pervasive on college campuses. And then we also have trainings and we have education, we have campaigns, but it's just scarcity. You know, Connecticut's a small state, but in essence, it really is not making the, the messaging that we want and need across the entire state to reach our young people. It's very limited. What's the impact on schools? Um, as it was eloquently shared, it is tremendous. I mean, you have people that are starting as young as 13 and 14. Let me just share a quick story. On my way here, I was in the car with a guy who was my Uber driver, and he asked me what I did, and I shared it. And I knew when I got in the car, I smelled smoke. Clean car, but I smelled it. And he says, you know, uh, I smoke. And I said, I know, I smell it. And he says, but I'm going to tell you something. I tried to quit. And he's an adult, and he says, I started when I was 14. And I said, what was it? And he said, peer, peer pressure. He went ice skating. Now this, and he said to me, this is the dumbest thing that I ever thought of. And he said, I thought that we thought smoking would keep us warm for ice skating. And he said, but I loved it. And from that moment on, I smoked and smoked and smoked. He's 70 years old. He tried to quit many times. He used Juul. 
He put out $120, he said. He said it burned his lungs. It hurt him to inhale. He threw all of that out. And he says, and he's still smoking. So what I'm saying to you is that it's starting at a very young age. It's starting with all of the peers. And one of the best approaches that we can take um, as public health has seen over and over again, is that peer approach. When we put together that t Tobacco 21 legislation, effective October 1st, it was beautiful. Not because all the legislators, I was a, myself as a commissioner, you know, our governors, and everybody was there. It was beautifully said. But when that young lady, who was a high schooler, stood up and said that she had three of her friends that were hospitalized, and one remaining friend who was hooked up to tubes, in the hospital as she was standing there speaking to us, what did I see sitting up front? Every single one of those young people leaned forward and listened. That's the impact that we have to have because people, young people truly honestly believe it is a safe practice and we have to continue to continue to educate, educate, educate. Uh, that's the challenge. Thank you. Uh, I have time remaining, but I'm, let me yield. Well, Cole. first of all, I want to thank each of you for your testimony. It's incredibly helpful, and uh, uh, I think uh, there's no question we clearly need to educate lots of folks about the dangers involved here, and you being here is part of that education process, so thank you. Uh, I think your advocacy will probably make a difference, already has, as my, uh, my good friend, the chair, has put additional resources behind these kinds of efforts, and uh, That'll be an interesting discussion we have with our colleagues in the Senate. The Senate um, you know, because I think uh, I think you're on the side of the angels here, Madam Chair. Um, but uh, you know, I do have uh, s some concerns, and so let me start with you, Dr. Sattel. Uh, we've had efforts to ban ent entire bans outright of e-cigarettes, and I think we'd all say, "Gosh, uh, we're, we're extremely worried about this youth epidemic." But how have those bans worked? What have been the consequences of them? It's been relatively recent, so you may not have any data. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you have an opinion about them, whether or not that's a good approach? That uh, vape shops have reported um, uh, an incredible decrease in, uh, in people who are patronizing them. And th that's the thing to worry about, of course, is if, it, you know, in the case of e-cigarettes, in the case of harm reduction, and this is basically we're talking about people who are addicted to nicotine, just as if we're, in a way, talking about people addicted to opiates. We deal with people with opioid addiction. We have methanol. We have needle exchange. These are risky behaviors, but we try to mitigate the risk. And that's what an e-cigarette device is for smokers. It's an attempt at at risk uh, mitigation. So the question is, and I've worked in methadone clinics my, my professional life, it's the question with addiction is always compared to what? And so if it's e-cigarettes, it, as opposed to smoking because a person has failed patches and gums and all the conventional uh, ways of quitting, then that is, that is an infinite benefit. Again, are these devices safe? No one would say that. And should they ever be used by non-smoking teens? Never. That's, uh, I think a very important point. Let me ask you this. You mentioned in your testimony the experience of the United Kingdom. Do they have the same explosion amongst youth that we clearly have in this country? Yeah, they don't. They don't seem to. And, it, and it's an interesting question. And the, the UK has had a, a a long record of harm reduction. In fact, they legalized heroin back in the twenties. Um, and uh, Michael Russell is one of their uh, most uh, kind of the godfather of of uh, smoking um, harm reduction. He's, he's always said people. Smoke for the nicotine because it's addictive, but they die from, from the tar. And Public Health England, which is their um, equivalent of our CDC, the Royal College of Physicians, they've all endorsed vaping as an alternative for smokers who can't quit any other way. Uh, and they, they have based it on, on research, and I certainly can provide all that. Yeah, well, I'm curious what they're doing on the marketing angle. I mean, you've all mentioned about marketing and targeting, and that's clearly a big problem here. And, and clearly uh, targeting toward an uneducated audience 
of young people in very duplicitous and, and deceptive ways. Do they have a problem in that, or they they have some set of? I'm looking, I guess, for a regulatory scheme yeah. that gets us a better outcome than we've got here, because there's no question we have this explosion amongst young people that really is concerning. It, it is interesting to think of the, the comparative approaches, and I, I don't know how they advertise to kids, but um, or. Uh, not advertised to kids, of course, but how their advertising could be mistaken to be attractive to children, you know, teens. That that I don't know, um, but um, but what's so important about uh, um, you know their approach again is that um, they is that they are. Forgive me, I sort of forgot my point for a moment. Um, well. Maybe ask me another question. It'll occur to, it'll occur to me. I, can't, I, don't, I, I don't have much time skip here. my mind. I'll just end with okay. this. I, you know, that's what I'm looking for is something we could do that would stop the academic or start educating people. Uh, at the same time, look, I have constituents that were lifelong smokers that will have told me, please, this is how I got off cigarettes. Don't put me back on it. Now, they're a smaller part the audience. And sometimes we are in the business of comparative goods and yeah. who's most at risk and that sort of thing. So I'm just trying to find if there are ways. We clearly have addiction problems, all sorts in this country. We're like 4% 4. Well, 4 of the world's population use half the illegal drugs. I mean, this is, this is like something in our DNA as a society at some level. Yeah. Well, we can't forget the purview of public health as all vulnerable people, teens right. and adults. But I did remember my point, which is that, and this is so key to the UK, which is they have nationalized health. They don't have an individual insurance. And that's why they're so invested in vaping, because this, the cost savings to the government could be huge. And that's a big difference between here and there. Interesting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Appreciate this hearing very much. Thank you. Congresswoman Roy Ballard. Since uh, the United Kingdom has been mentioned, um, since the 2016 uh, Royal College of Physicians report endorsing e-cigarettes as 95% less harmful than the combustible tobacco-containing kind, many in this country and in Congress have used harm reduction uh, as an argument to oppose any government regulation of e-cigarettes. However, that same year, the American Medical Association, the American Thoracic Society, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and 10 other medical organizations sent a letter to Congress that explains why they believe currently available data does not support the use of e-cigarette products as a smoking cessation uh, strategy. Uh, Dr. Helpern, uh, can you provide some clarity to counteract this harm reduction argument? And has any e-cigarette been found by the FDA to be safe and effective in helping smokers quit. Thank you for asking that question. It's a good one. Um, there, there has been a profound difference between what the UK data say and what our US data are saying. And part of it has to do with science, has to do with the methods that are behind this. A lot of it also has to do with, and in response to some of what we were hearing earlier, has to do with the marketing. In the UK, we don't have, they don't have the marketing to youth that we have seen here in the US. It doesn't exist. Also, their e-cigarette products are different. They have a nicotine standard where they have no more than 20 milligrams of nicotine in any given product. So they also just have different products, and they don't see it. They have started off it all along saying that it is a device for quitting, whereas in the U.S., that was not the original message. The original message was more to being a youth product. So that's one of the big differences there. In terms of do, do we have any safe products, no. As of now, we have no products, no e-cigarette products that have been submitted for pre-market authorization to the FDA, nor do we have any products that have been submitted as a cessation tool. Whereas in contrast, we do have products that are very effective in helping adults quit smoking, like nicotine replacement therapies, other medicines, cognitive behavioral therapy, and so on. So those are definitely more and have been approved, whereas e-cigarettes have not. Um, I passed a, a, a bill known as the STOP Act that was directed at educating parents about the dangers of underage drinking. Um, and this uh, national media campaign has actually helped to reduce underage drinking in this country. Uh, 
would you uh, suggest or what are your ideas in terms of having a similar uh, national campaign to educate parents about the dangers of vaping? For me, um, I think it would be a very good idea to have such. I go around uh, the country and Meredith and I team up on some of this work to give talks to parents throughout the country. But I will also say that. Uh, but but I will also say that. We, so yes, we do need to educate parents. In our toolkit, some of our materials on there do educate parents, where we have information about how it's hidden in plain sight and how easy it is to, to or how hard it is to spot these products and what parents need to be doing. But we also really do need national campaigns and information and help that go directly to schools, to healthcare providers, and to youth themselves. Parents, absolutely, but it is a bigger issue than just parents right now, and youth also in schools eight hours a day, and we need to really target schools as well in helping them. Ms. Berkman, your, your view? Yes, thank you. Um, I think there, again, I, I said this earlier, there's an enormous disconnect between all of the important work. I mean, we know, or, you know that CDC is working 24-7. But we also see education as a very important form of advocacy, and we're lucky enough to, you know, to share some. Bonnie shares some of her resources with us. We give a lot of parent presentations, and it is shocking to me that just the other day we spoke um, at I think it's the largest public high school in New York, and there were parents who were shocked by the information we were giving. You know, we're all we're all so deeply in this. But I also think there's an enormous disconnect between also public health providers. And I'll give you an example that terrifies me. Over the weekend, I mean, we have parents who reach out to us all the time. And, and I sometimes I carry these emails where people spend, you can see, you know, 45 minutes pouring out their hearts. You know, my child was a was en route to be, you know, recruited as a star athlete in college. And now he can't even run a mile. Or I had an easygoing kid who's having bouts of extreme anger. Or I have a kid who was a great tennis player. Now he has restrictive lung disease. Things that have been brewing for some time. But a woman reached out to us over the weekend in a panic. And she just sent it to our regular info line. And she said, I'm in the hospital now with my child. We were here before, a few weeks ago. She was in the pediatric ICU. She was sent home. Now we're back again. I'm terrified, she wrote to us, that the doctors here, and I won't say where she's from to protect her privacy, but a small town out west. She said, the doctors really don't know enough. How can you help me? And we immediately wrote back to her um, and saying, you know, how can, where are you, what hospital, and we didn't hear back from her again. And that, those kinds of stories are so common, and they're haunting. That's a parent who found us online, who may not have thought to go to you know, a CDC reporting portal or an FDA reporting portal, but she looked up parents, um, and her feeling, and we hear this a lot, is that the doctors in some places still don't know. We find that shocking, but it's true. I just want to make one other point, if I may. There's been so much talk about this outbreak and THC. But if you look a little more closely at the CDC's own numbers, when they say that 76% of cases are people who were using THC, that's not THC exclusively. Only 32% were using THC exclusively. Of the 58% who said they were using nicotine, um, not exclusively, 13%. But if you just focus on this as a THC crisis, it's an enormous mistake. This is a crisis of an entire generation of kids who are vaping, who have been having these symptoms for, in some cases, years. And the numbers we have are so important, but we need to get a pop, I don't know what it's called because I'm not a public health commissioner expert, but a population surveillance study that shows us what the symptoms are. Because if we don't start recording, and we talked a lot about the data, the recording, the modernization, if you don't start recording the symptoms of these 5 million kids, then we're going to have an even bigger problem for even more years. And again, I'm not a public health expert, but we hear from parents, hundreds and hundreds of parents who are so frightened, who see changes in their kids physically and emotionally. And they're terrified, and there's a disconnect. We need more education. We need more social media for kids and parents and doctors and everyone. Thank you. 
Commissioner? Yes, I did. I just want to support what was just being said. It's extremely important. At the State Health Department, we have, again, used many resources. The interesting thing is that I had to go about making it a reportable disease so that we could get a handle on what was going on. And that was just the beginning. We have surrounding neighboring states that we're working with and trying to find out what's going on there. And then that linkage to CDC, it is incumbent upon looking at how do we get additional funding and resources to really tie into a true data surveillance system that not just for this, because there will be other public health concerns that come about, but this is one clear example because of the, the loss of our young people and the addiction that we see that we really do need funding to support a, a true surveillance system that is at a state, at a local, a state, and a federal level that is totally connected. Absolutely. Thank you. If I may, two, two more quick follow-up points on this very important conversation. Um, first, when you're talking about funding for research, we really need to understand the nicotine levels that are in these products. You're hearing just today, in a span of an hour, differences between a pack of, nicotine, pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine and two. And I've never seen public health experts on the same side confused. We need research to understand it. Why? Similar to Meredith, uh, Meredith, I get called constantly by healthcare providers saying, how much nicotine replacement do I give? Not only is it not approved by the FDA to give this for those under 18, we know it is. We know that it's being used off-label. My adolescent medicine doc friends are using it all the time. But how much? Do you give one patch, which is 20 milligrams of nicotine? Do you give one and a half? Do you give two to match that 41? We don't know, and we really need the research to be able to inform healthcare providers. Second, we also need the research and the surveillance and the information to inform uh, schools, once again, because I get principals all the time who say, I am so tired of busting kids, I don't even want to go into the bathroom anymore because then I'm spending the entire day filling out paperwork, and I actually have other things I need to be doing. So we also need information and research to really inform those constituents as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a really great conversation. Um, 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 I, I don't know, Dr. Sattel, if you would like to add anything here? I would. Just one point. Um, E-cigarettes, again, commercial nicotine vaping, um, which is regulated by the FDA, but none of the devices have been approved yet. Oh, yes, they've all had to submit their... Um, they have not. No, no. I, I, I no, no okay, I, I'm referring, though, to the PMTAs. No, those are due in, in May of in this May, year. May 2020. Yes. They are, they are Although one just did submit last week. But, well, yes, it's true. They're not approved. They're not approved. I agree with that. That's a fact. But they have been around for at least 10 years. And uh, I don't disagree for a moment that... Um, if, if teens have tried them, I'm sh sure some of them have had respiratory, one would cough, you know, feel some irritation the next day. Um, kids with asthma will have that exacerbated, no question about that. But it hasn't been until this summer that we've seen these dramatic pulmonary complications. So that it is also another bit of evidence, in addition to the, the basic epidemiologic tracking of, you know, what did these people use and what, if, what was in their blood and what was in their urine and have they taken um, lung biopsies. But, um, uh, but the point is that uh, this makes, this is more, more suggestive evidence that what we're seeing is the illicit um, uh, cannabis products or illicit nicotine products. They're out there. And those should be, those aren't permissible either. Obviously a, a, a great topic and a various and points, of, points of view uh, and make, making the case, but it would also seem that, um, uh, and, and, and one of the points I will make is that uh, we have no scientific data. As I said at the opening in my statement, are these products safe? Are they unsafe? Uh, how do we regulate them? We have a regulatory agency that has abdicated its responsibility to regulate a product that we now find after 10 years of whatever it is, is creating a public health crisis. Um, so that I, I, you know, we have the tools 
to address an issue that's a public health crisis. We are not using the tools, and we are being subjected. I will tell you on the pre-market review, we are now looking at an industry that is pushing back, and it's a question I have for you, um, uh, Dr. halpern Fresher, is uh, about mint and menthol because the industry is pushing back when the uh, uh, HHS has said no mint, no menthol, no flavors, and they want to exempt mint and menthol. This is a money-making proposition for a tobacco industry. That is what is at the center of this effort. Let me ask you, uh, doctor, flavors, mint, menthol, attractive to kids? who would not normally smoke tobacco products? Absolutely, yes, no doubt about it. In our own data, we're showing that at least 30% of youth who were using e-cigarettes started and continued to use with mint and or menthol. And that's true not just with e-cigarettes, but across all tobacco flavors. And our latest publication shows that. And we talk to youth, and they will say, absolutely, I love mint, I love menthol, that is what I'm using. Let me ask you this. Um, your response to those who say these flavors are needed for adult smokers. I would say there's no evidence, and I would say that even if you like these flavors, I would you don't do that on the backs of youth. And not only that, as I said before, we have other ways for adults to quit smoking conventional cigarettes that are proven, that are approved by the FDA, whereas e-cigarettes are not. And if e-cigarette companies want to be approved and used by the F, uh, approved as a cessation device, then it's not just the pre-market review. They need to go through CEDAR. So there's a much higher standard if they're going to be arguing f to be a, a cessation device, and they have not gone through those proper so that's channels. That's what the FDA should be doing in that regard there. That is correct. And the illegal, well, let's just talk about, because there are challenges on the marketing of these, these, these products. And as a question across, illegal marketing created the perception that the devices are safe. Is, let me just ask you, uh, as a mom, do kids understand the risks involved? Even now, I think that they don't. What's really scary is kids now want to, now that the kids are frightened, they realize what addiction is. They're terrified. And my son comes home and says, Mom, there's a boy at school. He wants, he's scared, he's afraid he's going to get sick, but he doesn't know how to stop. How do I, what do I tell him? And I think, we don't have anything to tell him. They're addicts and they don't know it. What is the marketing doing to kids? So we have data on that as well and published. Um, we are well aware of the fact that the marketing is influencing young people. We did a study looking at flavor ads, not Juul, but across the board flavor ads, and we asked adolescents, are these ads targeting you, somebody older, somebody younger, because the e-cigarette market says they're targeting for adults. Uniformly, the young people in our study said they're targeting me, maybe somebody slightly older, what kid doesn't want to be older or slightly younger? Kids are not saying that they're targeting adults. We also did a study that we published looking at adolescents' perceptions of what are really not allowed cessation ads, like quitting and switching. And uniformly, youth knew that those were cessation ads, and those are implying if it's OK for adults to use them to quit, they therefore must be safe. So young people are, are not only attracted to the ads, they're being mis misled by the ads. And we have lots of papers that we publish and others, some of which I provided in my uh, written testimony, to show that adolescents are very much misperceiving the e-cigarettes, the products themselves, the harms, and the nicotine potential. Until recently, they were not aware and did not understand those terms. Just. Um Just there, there was one point that was was made. Is it is it true that adults who are using the uh, uh, e-cigarettes are also using cigarettes as well? That they're dual use. Is that am I am I wrong in that no. perception? No, you're not wrong. No. That's right. So they, that, that they do both. So it's not a question that if they have this, that they will go to cigarettes. They are correct. dealing with cigarettes at. at, at at, at the moment. The UK, that, well, we can get back to that. Let me just, my colleague, um, uh, let me just yield to my colleague from 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I'm going to yield to my friend from Maryland, if I may. I'm going to have to leave shortly. I've got another point. But, but before I do, I just want to thank each of you. This has been an excellent, excellent hearing, and we appreciate the information you brought to us. There's um, a lot of areas of agreement here, quite frankly, clearly uh, in terms of youth epidemic, clearly in terms of advertising concerns. Um, some areas of disagreement, but not the kind that would keep us from making additional investments here. And, and frankly, I think finding hopefully a better regulatory scheme than we currently have, because it doesn't seem to be getting the job done in terms of young people. Uh, but uh, that said, uh, I'll just uh, yield the remainder of my time to my friend from Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. I'm sorry I had to step out. Um, but this is obviously an important, an important topic. Clearly, no one wants you know, children to be exposed, develop habits that, that they shouldn't be developing. I think we have broad agreement on that. The question is how you go about doing that, because in the last panel, I think most of you were here. I mean, the bottom line is it's very hard to you know, stop this leakage across uh, age, and that's of a concern to me. You know, I have a, uh, a, you know, a staff member in the district was a chain smoker, you know, I guess about four years ago, started vaping, completely gave up combustible cigarettes. Now, I'm convinced, because I know I talked to him. You know, he's the guy who had a chronic cough, things like that. None of that. I mean, I'm convinced that his lifespan will be actually lengthened by this device. Uh, that being said, clearly, you know, if a 16-year-old decides that they're going to do this, and, and there's some evidence that more will decide to do this than smoke combustible cigarettes, that, that that's something we have to watch out for. My concern is that, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, the bottom line is how do we preserve uh, access to people for whom this is a very useful smoking cessation device. And look, we all have friends, we all have relatives, we have people who tried to stop smoking, they try the gum and they try the, the patches, they try everything, didn't work. And for some of them, e-cigarettes work, vaping works. So how do we do this and how do we avoid, and Dr. Stel, let me ask you, how do we avoid, one of my concerns is that if we outlaw it, we're gonna get black market stuff and the, you know, the testimony from the CDC was just that this is actually the problem. The problem is if you don't make it available, if someone says, look, I, this person works for me, says, look, I really want to stop smoking, he's going to go get a black market product. And that might be even, even more dangerous. So how do, we, how do we balance that? How do we come to the right conclusion? Well, I, th I think there's no question you will get um, black market uh, use. I mean, no, no question about that. Uh, the way to balance it is to preserve the flavors because Actually, there are data, there are a number of studies that show how essential they are to adults, and I, they're in my testimony, but um, so very significant that uh, evidence that the flavors matter, um, that pulmonary, fu uh, pulmonary function tests improve over time, and blood pressure. And now extrapolating that out, you would imagine life expectancy to be longer than if those people had continued to smoke, but we'll have to follow them. The way to do it is to uh, crack down much more much more aggressively than we've been doing. I know the FDA is working hard on this. I know Jewel has a, a $30 million campaign, but the enforcement on selling, the enforcement on age verification and so on, the, even still the packaging and all this, even though I know the FDA is working on it, that just has to be tripled down on. There's no question about that. Um, very important. Uh, someone mentioned before, though, I must say um, that puzzled as to why menthol and, and mint uh, still occur. Well, the biggest consumers of those cools and Newports actually are the African-American population. Uh, and I would worry, again, that they'd go back to their cigarettes because there's a, such a perversity in this issue. Cigarettes are legal. And now e-cigarettes are endangered. The, you know, the device that can help people who fail those other options, which do have a pretty poor track record of working, and it's wonderful when they can. I would always recommend something you don't have to inhale to get off cigarettes or cognitive behavioral therapy. They don't have to have nicotine at all. Um, but some people just can't. It's a last resort for them. And so these devices are so important, and flavors are so important to their effectiveness. So we have to preserve that for adults while beating every, uh, you know, intervention we can uh, it, targeted at preventing teen use. Sure. No, thank you. And, and I'll just ask generally, any, any of you can comment. You know, one of my concerns is that uh, the, the lung injury is now connected to the use of THC. Because I think we sent a message to our children that actually marijuana is safe. I mean, we call it a medicine. 
I mean, aren't medicines safe? How concerned are any of you that we're sending a message to children that marijuana is safe, and one thing we end up getting is this vaping uh, problem that has resulted in very serious lung injury uh, to, to young people? Dr. Harris, may I? Please. Yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, I think you were out of the room earlier. You know, if you look at the, C the CDC's own figures about why everyone keeps saying that this is just about THC, it's, it's not correct because 76% of um, the people who've had these issues were using THC not exclusively. And I haven't seen the breakdown that says um, if all 76% were using THC and nicotine, because it's 32% are only using THC, but 76% say THC and nicotine and perhaps other things. I'd have to look at those numbers. This is not just about THC. And I know this because if these kids are using THC in vapes, and I think we know from the research that many of them are, these kids, so many of them, started with nicotine. They likely started with Juul, right? That was the market disruptor. Nicotine, it's long been known and long been proven by scientists. And I am not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I've also read research. Nicotine is a gateway drug. Nicotine opens pathways for further addiction. So unless these kids are being, or these patients are being asked, what did you start with? We really will never know. This is about the youth vaping epidemic. This terrible outbreak is an outgrowth of the underlying epidemic that FDA failed to fully regulate these products, that we as a society allowed a company like Juul, worth $38 billion before maybe the last couple of months and its valuation was affected, to go into my child's school, to go into other schools, to use influencers and the flavors. We should talk about harm introduction rather than harm reduction. We're talking about a generation of kids we all know who would otherwise not have been initiated into tobacco use in such enormous numbers. Sure. No, no, I understand that. And my only point is that I'm going to disagree with you. I think there's actually a close link between THC use. Because if you look at the number of people who, who have this disease who said they use THC versus the number of people who vape and have not used THC, the discrepancy explains that it is a, there is a clear association. Just so everybody always understands, I mean, you're not saying there's no association. I'm not saying there's no association, but much. there's no thank answer you. about what thank the problem you is. You're thank welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead. Actually, I wanted to also follow up with a comment, one that was said earlier that will also reflect um, in responding to um, Congressman Harris. Um, the statement was made that we have just recently seen the impact of uh, e-cigarettes and vaping. Um, I will beg to differ. I will beg to differ to say that there have been situations where many people are now reflecting, saying that I have had respiratory distress, respiratory illness uh, over a span of years. So has it just not has happened this year that we are now seeing the skyrocketing. The unfortunate thing is that uh, people were thinking that it could be the environment, it could be an environmental issue, but the bottom line is that it still goes back to support of having some type of surveillance <laughs> system in place so that we we can comparatively collect data and look at what's happening. I will secondly say that the black market exists. Let's just be honest. It exists. It's going to exist. And there's an underground that is pervasive to our young people that is so attractive to them. It is intentionally attractive to them. So we would be remiss, and I come from strictly a public health perspective, we would be remiss if we did not do something in regards to overall population health, in regards to addressing nicotine and its effect and its addictive behaviors that it has on people. But at the same time, we need to do something period, in regards to the impact that it is having on our young people. And why? Because they're getting hooked at a very early age, which makes it difficult for them to somehow cease, stop using these particular products, and they go on, as it has been said, to use other products. And we are going to end up, as I said earlier, and you weren't here to hear this, with a nation of a whole generation that has perished or have severe chronic illness that will impact our health care costs tremendously. But besides that, it's going to impact quality of life. And I also said, ultimately, death, which we've already seen. Go ahead. Thank you. Wrap it up. I, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I just want to say also that 
when we're talking about research and we're talking about funding and regulation, it's not just the e-liquid that's in these, it's also the device. And what we're also seeing is that young people are taking the same devices that they became addicted with, with nicotine, opening them up, whether it's Juul, which is a closed system, or the open system like the mods, opening them up and putting all the other products into it, such as marijuana. So it's, it's, it's not just the, whether we're talking about nicotine e-cigarettes, it's a combination of the nicotine, the marijuana, and the vaping devices themselves that we need research on. And like was said earlier, I get calls from physicians for the last three, four years saying that they're seeing vaping-related illnesses, pneumonia, asthma, that they could only trace back to e-cigarettes even before the current epidemic. Well, first of all, let me just say, um, as my colleague, Congressman Cole pointed out, this has been an extraordinary hearing, um, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Shuket at CDC and what they're, uh, what they're engaged and involved in, and with all of you and the, the, the richness of the information about what has uh, struck us, and it has its roots years and years ago, but it's now here full blown. And I'll go back to the principle that I started with on, on this because I, it was the Congress that gave the authority to the FDA to look at all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. The FDA, and I will continue to repeat, prior administration and in this administration abdicated the responsibility of looking at the safety of this product that now is on the market, that is sweeping the country, that has created an increase with young people that is of epidemic proportion, as we hear, and now we see that the result is of serious illness, lung injury, and even death. And we have, at the moment, no data from which to go with. You can talk about each of the pieces, the increase in the uh, uh, vaping by youngsters, you can talk about the illness, but unless we address the fundamental issue, we really are not going to get to the bottom of, of this. Uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the hearing a, rec a letter from NACCHO, NACO, and Hearing none, no, not so ordered. Um, I, um, there are so many, so many pieces here. You talked about devices. Well, part of the devices, some of those devices come from China. We haven't got a clue as to what they are, whether they explode, whether they don't, what are the repercussions of the devices themselves. We have heard about the UK, um, and th there is, uh, 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 there, there, there is, really, in essence, uh, a discussion about that data uh, there, but you all have highlighted what's different here than what's different there, but the data is subject uh, 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 to uh, whether it's criticism or whether it is, it, it is real or not, etc. Et so there's so many pieces that need to be investigated. Um, we have an outbreak. We have epidemic levels. CDC will continue to investigate. I want, the, I want them to be more clear in their recommendations. They are clear, but they recommend. They do not create uh, the, uh, the, the, the policy. The FDA, and that's not in the jurisdiction here, but in the jurisdiction of the Agriculture Subcommittee, and the reason why I speak about that so because I sit on the uh, Agriculture Subcommittee, and I'm the senior member of that, of that subcommittee. The FDA has got to uphold its mission. We need to move faster. We need to take action. It's now a month since the Secretary said we were going to move forward on the flavors. Nothing has happened as of yet. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, for decades, the tobacco industry has lied to us. There are those of us who are sitting here will remember the hearing that Congressman Waxman had when each member held 
their hand up and said that nicotine was not addictive. We don't put people in this committee under oath. Those folks were under oath at that time, and we found out that it was peddling of false information. And now we are looking at false information about e-cigarettes. It is not allowable for the tobacco industry to regulate itself. And if we so allow that, then we're not doing our jobs. Uh, if we focus only on, we do have to focus on THC, but if we only focus there, we are missing the full scope of this of this effort. We need to provide more resources, which is what this subcommittee did. And we will go to battle with our, our, our colleagues on the Senate side uh, so that we can provide the kinds of, 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 of resources that are necessary for smoking and smoking cessation, but in addition to building a public health infrastructure that can allow our very committed commissioners of public health around the country to be able to do their job when so much of this responsibility is placed on, on the states. So again, I want to thank you. I want to thank my colleagues, ranking member. Thank you. I know you had things to do as well, but thank you for being here. Uh, Congressman Harris, thank you for hanging in until the end. But to all of you, let's keep on. Please make your voices heard. Thank you very, very much. And let me conclude this hearing. Thank you.